Hello and welcome to Harry Potter and the Rewind Reviews. This week we are sitting down to take a look at Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Unfortunately for those of you who enjoy the books but not the movies, we are. it's the movie version. It's a movie podcast. We're doing movies. Um, sorry about that. Um, if you're wondering, hey, where's all that context gone? It's the movie version. That's the problem. Um... I have a feeling the book will come up a fair bit. <laughs> um, no, I, no, I don't think so. No, 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 no. Because I, 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 I don't care what the, what the book's explanation for it is. There's no explanation for many things in the movie. And that's the problem. <laughs> that's, mm. The issue is the absence of information, not a difference of information. <laughs> so and, I yet, actually, I don't... I, and I can say, oh, in the book, this is the explanation. But that doesn't actually prove or disprove any point I'm going to make about this film. Because the the film's lack of explanation of many things is 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 the problem, <laughs> but and yeah, yet I st- I still maintain a little conflicted, and I can't decide mm-hmm. now. So for all the all the context um, of our love of Harry Potter, uh, you can find on on mainly the first episode of this podcast. Um, mm-hmm. We started the last one by ranking. I want to rank. I want to rank at the end because. Yep. I need to discuss this film to work out where I land. That's fair. Because, so going straight into it, and for context, uh, Dan and I, my favourite book, Dan's joint favourite book, uh, mm-hmm. with Half-Blood Prince. No, Order of Phoenix. Mm-hmm. Um, so, let's dive right in, because this is, a, this is a popular film amongst Harry Potter fans, and I yeah. get it. I'm really conflicted by this movie. More so than I think I will be by any other movie that we're going to watch for this series Mm -hmm. because my memory of it as a kid, as I've already said uh, on another episode was came out of the cinema, unhappy, perplexed because I was like, unless you know the book, how is anyone going to understand what the fuck went on in the last half an hour of that movie? Like completely mind blown. Like what? And my memory of, that lasted and whenever anyone was like prisoner of azkaban is the best film i was like is it because <laughs> mm. it's not my memory of it but i upon watching it um one i'll just say i think you you don't get any of the context as dan said but i can understand someone vaguely understanding what's gone on but here are the reasons i'm conflicted because the end is so missing, like you say, the context, the nuance. And I mean, let's be fair. The last half of that, I started listening to the audiobook to go, well, maybe I'm being unfair. Maybe it's my memory. So I listened to Stephen Fry read the chapters in question, which are, you know, uh, Cat, Rat and Dog, The Servant of, uh, of uh, Lord Voldemort, um, the, uh, womb, the Wormtail Moody, that chapter. And, you know, there's a good, two hours left of the book at that point in terms of audio so i understand it but as a huge fan of that book the fact that we don't get the nuances of the of the ending and that of those last chapters and stuff because it is my that is my not only is it my favorite book that whole bit is my favorite section of any harry potter book i love the 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 affection you can hear by the way they talk and reminisce about their past the the way that it all winds together so beautifully the way that the pieces of the puzzle come together so beautifully is is incredible and i know what you're thinking you're thinking the film has less time give it you know a bit of a break some things have to go because of adaptation and yeah that's fair but this movie also does a lot of dumb shit. One one random example, you don't need in this movie to actually particularly make the fact that they can't do magic outside of school a plot point. And yet you have Mr. Dursley reiterate that and you have Harry Potter and Fudge discuss it. So if you're going to choose to make a plot point out of the fact that you can't do magic outside of school, don't fucking start the movie with Harry trying to do magic to it with himself outside of school. Like, what the... Like, and I don't mean... I don't mean the Art Petunia stuff. I mean the movie starts with him sitting trying to do a luminous charm so he can read his school books under the bed sheets. What the fuck is going on? And, like, little things like... Um, Lupin, the map doesn't lie. Serious, the map... Ne- or it, it was on the map. It could be wrong. The map's never wrong. How the fuck is Sirius not going... Oh, you've got the map back? Like, is that the Maunders map? Oh, like, it's it's full of stuff like that. Like, just big stuff that I'm like, I understand it, but I think there must have been a way to get some of that nuance in. And little stuff where you just go, this is really dumb. 
But on the other hand, <laughs> the only word I can think of descri to describe how this movie is put together in most other ways is altered. It the 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 long panning shots, the transition shots. There is literally beautiful uh, cinema making in this in this film. Like the the cinema on display is just fantastic. The the the, the weight that's given to Lupin and Harry's relationship, the symbolism of that discussion where you have them facing in opposite directions and then they face together and then there's a wall between them and the camera is moving in and out and the camera movements and the acting, the performances and the blocking all mean something and symbolises something. Uh... Mr. Weasley and Harry sat and the way they moved to frame themselves with the poster of black in between them. Like, there's real artistry on display in the in the putting together of this film. And it just makes me incredibly conflicted. And I've rambled over to you, Dan. Initial thoughts? Um, yeah, I, I, I have a similar... I've landed in a similar place. Um, I think as a film, from a filmmaking perspective, for all the reasons you just listed and a hundred more, um, Kiran made one of the most distinct, interesting looking filmic Harry Potter films that exists. He genuinely went and made a movie. You know, he wasn't... If not, if not, if not the most, I think. But obviously we need to rewatch the rest, but yeah. Yeah, but certainly from my position right now, having not seen the latter movies for quite some time certainly feeling like that's going to be my feelings even towards the end of this but we'll, we'll see we'll, we'll, time will tell but you know I, I i have to respect the filmmaking on display and i have to respect the storytelling on display it's very clear that he sat down with uh cloves and they decided what was and was not important to make the story function now there's very very important distinction to be made here there is a difference between narrative functionality just a story functioning an audience just understanding the basics of what is happening and a really cohesive narrative where all the motives make sense and all the subtext is there and all the or you, you you truly understand how we got to where we got so what this film ends up doing as a compromise is all of the plot actually i think this is why often you may have felt conflicted, Chris, over the years watching this movie about whether it does work if you are or not already a fan of the book. Because I think, strictly speaking, as long as you're paying attention and you're listening to every... Because some stuff is not repeated more than the one little line that they pass. So if you happen... If your mind happens to wander for a split second during some of these exposition scenes, good luck to you. But assuming that you really focus and pay attention to every little scene, you don't find yourself, you know, distracted by the beautiful imagery for a moment. Um, the, the plot makes sense, strictly speaking. Mm. But it leaves in its wake a thousand questions when you spend even a second thinking about it. How did Sirius, in the movie, don't I don't need the answer from the book, I know the book explains it, how did Sirius know where Pettigrew was hiding? Mm. How... Did he escape Azkaban? How did the map get invented? Where did that come from? Are we just going to assume that's just a random thing? If we're not telling the story of the Whomping Willow's installation and the Shrieking Shack's sort of use, you know, including the, the backstory for Lupin, then are you not asking yourself as a viewer, how did Sirius know to get in? To Hogwarts through the Whomping Willow. Why does Pettigrew, uh, not Pettigrew, sorry, um, why does Lupin immediately believe that Sirius betrayer, uh, sorry, that uh, Pettigrew was really the real b betrayer? There's so much missing context that the second you question almost any of the elements of this story, they fall apart pretty quickly. Now, the answers exist. They exist in the book, but I'm not going to bother going through them. It's not, it's, not, it's not the point of this. The point of this is when you sit down to watch this movie, you'll follow it as there's a guy out to kill Harry. That's his intent because he thinks Harry, what the movie tells us is that he thinks Harry brought down the fall of Voldemort and he was a supporter of Voldemort. Bad dude, right? Murdered a bunch of people. Oh yeah, another question. If, he, if, if he's innocent of murdering a bunch of people, we never explain who did. 
in this movie. As far as the movie is concerned, I think he still killed a bunch of muggles, right? No? We never explained someone else did that. But yeah, fine, whatever. Okay, so there's a guy, he killed a bunch of muggles, he's a lunatic, he was a supporter of, of you-know-who, he's on his way to get Harry. Okay, fine, I'll, I'll, I'll bite movie, that's the plot, cool, let's go. So then we reveal um, that actually, he isn't the, 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 the perpetrator of the... He, no, sorry, then we learn that he was not only um, a muggle killer that, uh, that, that's on the loose and coming after Harry, but actually he's gone after Harry specifically, um, having betrayed Harry's parents already. Because he was at one time a friend of Harry's dad's. Okay, fine, tick, fine. That makes that's, okay. That's a it's a reasonable twist. He was Harry's godfather. Okay, that gives them a more personal connection as two potential antagonists in a movie. You know, Harry protagonist, serious antagonist. Cool. That I understand they've got a personal relationship now. It's connected to a betrayal of Harry's parents. It's personal for Harry now. I'm okay with that. That's good. Movie, good plot, cool. Yeah, you borrowed from the book. But, you know, it works. Functional. We get to the point where we reveal Pettigrew. Um, is actually the perpetrator of the betrayal, and that really Sirius is this lovely guy that got screwed over and has been thinking. First of all, why hasn't he escaped sooner? Why is he? How did he escape? What's the pedigree stuff? Then we reveal Lupin also happened to know them at school, but we give no more information about that. Were they close friends? Unclear. But they hug and embrace like brothers, <laughs> which is I'm pretty sure how it's described in the book. So tick there. But context. <laughs> Mm. suddenly you're going well wait a minute why lupin's a werewolf too like and why can he turn into a dog why is he a rat like there's just so much key information the story of the film makes perfect sense it's a real a to b of reveals right killer on the loose actually has a connection to harry's past plot twist it was someone else and he was wrongly accused harry goes to free him here we are uh, he doesn't get to prove his innocence, but at least he's a free man again. Fine. And you could watch that and get all that from it and go, cool. But the minute you question any element of that story and how any of it actually works and how any of it come together, you would just be lost immediately um, without the information that the book provides on top of that. And I just think that is an absolute... Well, well, it's a shame for a start, because the context is what makes all of that storytelling really powerful. But I also actually don't 100% know the answer to solving that. Because a part of me thinks, well, maybe maybe we spend a little bit less time... Oh, God. what? Maybe we spend slightly less time on the time travel stuff at the end, as fun as that is, just to give us like an extra few minutes of time in the Shrieking Shack... Or even earlier, because they even tried. They even do one cl- quite clever thing to try and condense it: is they reveal and set up Pettigrew being alive through the thing earlier than the book does. But Harry never sees Pettigrew on the map in the book. Lupin yeah. does, and Lupin doesn't reveal that until later. In the movie, Harry sees Pettigrew, and we establish to the audience that possibility of Pettigrew still being alive you know, uh, two-thirds into the book. Now, that's actually a pretty good information cost-cutting tactic because when we get to the Shrieking Shack, we don't have to spend a lot of time explaining how Lupin even knows because we know how Lupin knows. We know the way we know, and we already knew because we, you know, we were we're already sort of set up for the possibility that Pettigrew's alive. But even introducing who Pettigrew is, they have to, like, do a bad, like, voiceover to clarify who he is. Um, when Harry sees the, the the name on the map, because they've only ever said it in one really rushed line of dialogue, and that's my next problem: the dialogue. Like the dialogue is all so manic and rushed, and flies by a million miles a second, and they're all just like, "Maybe it's this. What is this? But there's this, and there's this, and it's just like if you, again, if you miss one tiny sentence, you, that information is gone forever for you. You're not unless you're watching the whole movie again. You're not. You're, you're, you're not. That's a piece of key information that's gone. Um, uh, particularly the two bad examples are the shrieking shack scene and um, the scene in Honey Dukes with McGonagall and thingy well. McGonagall just does this really awkward information dump. <laughs> to Madame Rosmerta. Why? <laughs> because because she happened to like in the book they're having a drink. It's yeah. like but in this she just she just happened to ask in the doorway. Right. So McGonagall's yeah. like, well fine. <laughs> <laughs> they like rush in like they need to tell Mo- uh, Rosemurta that information. Like, Rosemurta, get in, get in, private room, we've got some stuff to tell you. Like, wait, why? Why does she need to know any of this? 
Like, it's very, very strange. Whereas in the book, it is, it's like you said, it's McGonagall and I think Fudge, maybe, and a few others, and Hagrid all sort of gathered round and uh, they're just sort of talking around a, around a bar a bit, you know, like that. It's, it's, a, it's a weird, casual sort of bit of old school gossip where they sort of clarify some things that, you know, that, 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 that Harry doesn't yet know, but that obviously is pretty common knowledge for them. But also, I just don't think they do a very good job of establishing that Harry, that, sorry, that Harry's dad was a great friend of Sirius. There's just uh, basically there's just so much context lost. I, I, I'm repeating myself now, but, just, but it's my point is, I don't know how you fix that because this movie, this book, sorry, has a lot of stuff that needs to be covered in it for context, and I don't know what it is you cut because they've already cut an awful lot. Um, they do lots of really good, clever cost cutting techniques in terms of pages. Um, they don't dick about with Mr. Weasley um, telling Harry what's going on. In the book, there's a whole section where Harry overhears Mr. and Mrs. Weasley debating whether Harry can take the information that Black might be out specifically to get him. And Weasley, Mr. Weasley's logic is, well, him and the, the other two, they run off all the time. They, they, we've, we've got to tell them because they're just going to continue to run around. They need to know so they can be, be safer at Hogwarts. And we just cut straight to Mr. Weasley telling Harry that. We don't do the back and forth and the debate about it, you know. Um, so that's pretty good. We, we In the, the opening of the movie, there's a load of condensing that happens to get the Aunt Marge stuff done really quickly um, in a way that makes sense and works. It's a shame because, again, in the book, you get a chance to really appreciate what an evil human being Aunt Marge is, so you get more satisfaction out of seeing her blow up. But in the in the in the in the movie version, fine, you get you get enough to understand it. And when she goes off, you still have a little smile on your face. That's great. And in fact, they go one step further in the movie than the book because in the book she just floats and hits the ceiling, and in the movie she just she just she just floats off into space. And I just yeah, I like I the idea do... that like you know she nearly hit a blimp. Or a plane. <laughs> yeah, and they also, they do, you know, she, I mean, she 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 refers to Harry's mum as a bitch. <laughs> like, so they do. Which is, yeah. which is as I, a line, I, directly pulled from the book. But, but because they've chosen to keep that line, I think mm-hmm. you get, you get way more of a context for she's a bit of an arsehole than Sirius and, and James being the best of friends, for example. Yeah. You, know, you get way more justification for that than... And I think actually having re-listened to it, there's an element of this in the book as well. But Jesus in the movie, why why would ha- why does Harry have any reason to be like, yeah, I'll live with you? Like <laughs> that's just it's it happens so quick, so rushed. I oh, know, but Chris, don't Siri- you, didn't, didn't you hear? He made a he made a funny joke a few minutes ago about not wanting to be a dog. Well, you know, why not then? You know, Cause, and cause even James, even in remember, the book, J- James, on... James said he could he could be he should be a dog all the time, and he didn't he didn't, he, didn't, he, didn't like, he couldn't stand the idea of having the tail. Well, there you go. So on... he must be a great fun guy that Harry wants to live on, with. Uh, on reflection, you know that is that is a little bit even in the book. No, it's no, like, that's a hundred percent a problem. In the book too. But yeah, but the yeah, it's just. At least the and so to because I obviously agree with everything you just said and you know what I don't even have I don't even have a suggested you could fix it by taking out this to concentrate on this because like you say that chapter in the book that gives all the exposition there's not really much wasted in that chapter and that chapter's like I think half an hour on the audio book yeah. so how you I... sit down and tell a half an hour story in a two and a half hour movie. I don't know. The, the more I'm thinking about just... it, the more I'm thinking the dialogue is a big part of this. I think mm. the dialogue is bad in this movie, and I think that's the problem. It's either heartlessly, coldly expositional, and therefore doesn't work, or it's so charactery and flowery that you actually miss the information, and it never finds that middle ground that Rowling's dialogue uh, from the book does. Um, and yeah, just to clarify, because we've said this in all the other ones, um, we've said, we, you know, rolling bad, we, we know. Uh, <laughs> do you think you need to, do you think you need to be bold? And even though they are arguably, potentially, two of the, if not the, best sequences in the movie, do you think you need to go, we need to cut 
Petunia or the night bus. And and the night bus is probably the best sequence in the movie. The visuals either, are brilliant. It's either the night bus the, or Harry riding the hippogriff. Yeah, also great, but also takes up a fair amount of time. Um, but brilliant. Um, yeah. The the night bus. I suppose we've chosen we, we we've we've chosen two scenes there really where dialogue doesn't doesn't matter. Um, where you don't need dialogue to understand what's going on because, like you say, the rest mm-hmm. of the dialogue is so flawed. But Row- Rowling herself said. The idea of the bus squeezing in between two muggle buses was genius and not in the books. And she, when she saw that and heard yes. about it, she was like, oh, that's an amazing idea. Why didn't I put that in the books? Um, you know, the, the visuals yeah. of the night bus, the way that's constructed. I don't, mm-hmm. know, I don't know the decision to make Tom. I saw this was in a video. I think there's Movie Flame has a good video where he talks about the positive. Or were they? Sorry. I don't know. Gender. Um, apologies if I've um, misgendered. Where uh, they talk about... Um, they talk about the cinematography and how great this movie is, but I think mm-hmm. they also, I think it's in that or something else that makes the point of like, why do they change the character of Tom the barman so much to like be comic relief? Oh, I got another one, Dan. This, this blew my mind. Right. Right. <laughs> this really annoyed me. Um, and I'm worried this podcast is just going to be us just ranting, but there we go. That's, Hey, that's the honest reaction to these movies. I loved, I loved another example of something. This movie does really well. I loved the scene where they're all back at Hogwarts together and the boys are in the dormitory playing with the sweets that make them make animal noises and they're geeing each other on and then it pans out and they begin to have like a bit of a, a, a rough and tumble fight. I was like, that is the first time... I've and 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 arguably even you know the books never dwell on it dwell on them as an entire group too much and it's probably the loveliest moment of the Gryffindor bo- Gryffindor boys from that year bonding and having fun and you really get a sense of especially you know in a world where at home someone's at uh, technically his home some you know his Muggle home uh, some someone's just called his mum a bitch you really get the sense of. This is why Harry loves this place. This is why Harry is home. It's an amazing moment. I I love that. I think it's a really clever decision to to do that. And I believe the idea, the sweets that make the animal noises, I believe that's original to the to the film um and ties in beautifully with, you know, the Animagus stuff that's not necessarily in the film but should be. Um wonderful stuff. Wonderful idea. In a world Dan where You've already done that scene with these five boys and you have Dean, Seamus Mm -hmm. and Neville, all of whom don't naturally have a lot of dialogue (laughs) and that you could easily give dialogue to when you have these three characters established and reset up in this movie. Did the filmmakers (laughs) decide... To chuck in an additional Gryffindor boy and give him two important lines. <laughs> Who is Bem? <laughs> like, that's that's the credit on the DVD, I believe, to that character who says about what the grim omen means. And they say something else. Oh, I can't hilarious. remember the other line. Because I had to Google it and I was like, who's this kid? Like, you have Neville, Dean and Seamus there. You have them in those scenes. Why didn't they have that dialogue? It's crazy to me. It's, a, it's another example of why I'm so conflicted about this movie. Because on the one hand, amazing scene with the with the dormitory. One of the best moments of them, the characters bonding across the series. I mean that, books and TV. And sorry, books and movies. Mm-hmm. And yet, it is countered by... Yeah, but they also didn't give... Neville Dean or Seamus lines that they easily could have done. They invented a character. And like, I, I, I believe they retconned it later. I don't know if it's in your trip, but they retconned it later. And basically the, the, that character was now from Ravenclaw, I think. But like, apparently one of the explanations at the time was, oh, well, he's another Gryffindor, bo- Gryffindor boy in their year. He just doesn't sleep in their dormitory. Well, that's, what? Yeah, but that, doesn't that contradicts work everything. All. It doesn't work at all. That contradicts everything we know. Um, bamboozling. I think 
One other thing I want to, I, I do want to talk about, and I think it's actually really, it, it probably plays into something similar to this as well. Sometimes it's hard to to realize that your book, that book, that book knowledge is making you not see the forest for the trees. And I, I want to, and I'm yeah. gonna, I'm gonna bring up, and I feel comfortable doing this, Chris, because I went through the same experience as you just described a few minutes ago at the beginning of this podcast. But I want to talk briefly about the uh, the Harry doing w- w- uh, magic in at home moment. <clears throat> because I wrote, Chris, a ton of stuff in my notes the minute I saw that. Ugh! Why can he have done magic? Are they about to explain that he can't do magic in two scenes? Because he's going to have to get in trouble with Aunt Marge. So what the fuck is happening here? And then I wrote all that, and I watched most of the movie, and then the movie finished, and I was pondering it, and I went, I'm an idiot. Yeah, all right, you're not allowed to do magic at home, but we haven't established the trace or any ability for the magical world to know when he's doing magic. They skipped that part of the last movie. Mm. He, He was alone, in secret, and he got away with it. Book knowledge has skewed us there. Because the movies yeah, but, but why, have established but... absolutely no way. And any n- normal audience member will watch that and go, well, are you okay? He does the magic in his room. No one there to see it. Fine. He does the magic on his aunt. Quite noticeable. In trouble for that one. So in that case, though, in a world where you need dialogue, all the dialogue you can get, why have Harry and du- Harry and Fudge discuss it? Why have Harry raise it as a question for Fudge? Because we've already established that that he would be in trouble for doing that because we did that at the end of the first movie, that he's not allowed to do magic outside of school. And we've had... We, we're, we're basically establishing why he's in trouble at all. Well, he's not really in trouble in the, in the, in the book, but yeah. <laughs> well, no, he's not in trouble because yeah, they're yeah. just so relieved he's not been murdered by Sirius Black because that wouldn't look great in the press. But... <laughs> um, yeah. But what I'm saying is that criticism, as much as it doesn't seem like it's rooted in book stuff and that it doesn't function in the movie, absolutely is rooted in book stuff. Because there is just anyone else watching that movie clearly can see not being caught, being caught, because they don't have any information about the trace. Which for those of you who don't know, if you're book, film watchers but not book readers, in the, in the, in the books there's a, the government have a magical trace on any dwelling that has um that that, that has a, a Hogwarts student in there with well the, the the trace is on all magical students up until a certain age when they pass their exams basically um uh and i think oh no it's not even their exams it's the, it's an age thing sorry it's an age thing it's well, as soon as they turn 17 the trace is lifted and they're allowed to do magic outside of school and when someone does magic they can detect it but it's a flawed system because they can often they often mistake magic as happening. And we talked about it last week with Hermione. She fixes Harry's glasses and we were like, well, how did they get away with that? Well, no one... The, the reality is... The, the explanation we gave was, well, there's magic happening everywhere around in Diagon Alley. They won't be able to trace it. But the actual explanation, and which is the explanation I think these films have gone with, is just that they don't have the trace. <laughs> so... Well, I, and I, I think you... That logic, though, is also... Um, as, as... I think you can use that logic both as you've done there to go, that's a problem because we know the situation Mm -hmm. and apply the reverse of, I think the reason, uh, um, you know, if this sounds insulting in any way, I don't mean it to, I really don't because not everyone's fucking doing this and not everyone is, you know, spending their days talking about narrative and stuff like that. I sometimes say, I'll be talking about a TV show with someone and I will use the word narrative and I will just see them go, oh, fucking, you're talking way... Just the word alone, you know, will make them go, you're talking way too deeply. I think one of the reasons a lot of Harry Potter fans love this film is because the muddled dialogue and madness of no context at the end isn't a problem for them because they know the context. And even even at 13 years old or whatever I was, I couldn't switch that part of my brain off. That part yeah. of my brain... I came out that film going, 
like I said, I came out of that film going, I don't understand how no one who's read the bo- who's not read the book would understand that movie. Whereas most people who were big fans of the book couldn't give a shit about what someone who's not read the book thinks. <laughs> like, but and, I, yeah, and I'm not. But you know. I, I mean, but but let's be honest. We both know there are millions of people who've seen these movies without reading those books that still think these movies, particularly this one, is great. Yes, because it functions. Because as you said earlier, yeah, exactly. it functions. They, they, they at least understand it. And and the, maybe the you know the magic of of the things we've praised this film for, and we we will praise it for others, I'm sure. But mm-hmm. you know the 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 fun of Aunt Petunia, the fun of the night bus, the magic in the in the cinematography and the and the way the camera moves, the fact that it just feels so inherently more uh, like a like a adults film in a way you know as opposed to the first two which feel like children's family films and i still we've we've criticized this film more than complimented it about some huge big issues and i still haven't decided yet whether i would actually still rank it my favorite because of yeah. all the good it does <laughs> like that's what's maddening <laughs> yeah because i think this film is one of those really weird and frustrating examples of the highs are as high as anything like uh, genuinely it, out of context harry riding buckbeak is to this point maybe my favorite scene in any of these movies just the beauty of it the like the majesty of it the the, the, the skimming across the water with the castle framed in the background his terror turned to joy it's everything about these it, it, it represents so much about harry's time here how scary the magical world is, but how wonderful it can be at the same time. What a fucking great scene. And and that includes the stuff around it. You know, the lesson itself, um, the moment where Hagrid says, and this is all from the book, obviously, but the moment where Hagrid says, am I doing okay? Is the lesson all right? And then, like, you know, Malfoy immediately getting himself into a bunch of shit, like getting Hagrid into shit by getting himself injured and not listening to what Hagrid's advice is. Slightly, again, slightly spoiled by dialogue, though, because... Hagrid calls him a great brute eh, about two minutes earlier. <laughs> and I know that Malfoy describes him as an ugly brute, which is different, but still. <laughs> if the whole point oh, is I thought he don't, described him, I thought he described insult him as the a... fucking hippogriff, maybe listen I... to your advice, Hagrid. I still had a problem with him insulting him. I thought exactly the same as you, but I thought the insult came as he's shooing him away after Draco. But it's still, it's still regardless, even if, like that's right or wrong i still had exactly the same reaction in that moment and i may be remembering it wrong of just hold on you would literally just be talking about not insulting him although i will say tom felton's performance in that scene is spectacular mm-hmm. the way he's like what is it like i'm dying i'm dying like, <laughs> yeah. it's just yeah. so it's good so yeah. funny <laughs> so yeah. brilliant yeah. Um and and that's the thing the the performances are better. Oh, I never I this is the first time I truly appreciated how well they do uh Lupin and Harry. Mm-hmm. Like so, some of those scenes are just phenomenally acted, shot and put together. And and actually some of the least offensive dialogue. Um because there's some subtlety to it. Um <laughs> Yeah, it's in particular the scene where they're on the weird sort of bridge thing that the films mm-hmm. do that I don't remember particularly being in the books, but the films use all the time. Um, well, the film use all, the films yeah. use all the time from this point onwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, that 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 scene's great. The Emma Watson again, like I'm really coming out of this podcast going, Emma Watson was brilliant in these movies and I didn't kind of appreciate just how much. Uh, mm. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and like you know, we can we we can and probably will go through a bunch of things that just like don't make sense and stuff. But I think that 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 is my overall thought. I I genuinely think, for me, just as a as a overall sort of like, uh, do I like or not like this movie? I think this movie is a real mixed bag, and I think it has some of the biggest highs of the series and some of the lowest lows, including the design of the werewolf. That's the worst werewolf I've ever seen. I hate it. I know what you were going for, but it didn't work. Sorry. Try again. No. Bad movie. But Bad again. movie. I want to hit it, hit, it round, <laughs> hit, it round, hit the movie around the nose with a rolled up newspaper. Bad movie. Bad but, movie. But again, Do werewolves I, properly. 
I don't. I don't want to make this a thing because it means we won't. We, we, you know, we won't ever actually then discuss something. Mm-hmm. But again, what's so infuriating about this movie? I counter that with how genius is it in a world where you can't go. I feel cold or get into the characters' minds like they can in the book. How genius is it to have the Dementors turn water and condensation and all that stuff into ice whenever they mm. appear? Just an just beautifully shot, an amazing visual, and again a really clever decision, like a really clever filmmaking decision to go. And whether you know it was in the script, I don't know. Like because the the dialogue makes you just question how any part of the script could be, you know, that clever. Um, but with no offense to anyone, but just just a wonderful idea and yeah yeah, and can i tell uh, you you a funny bit of trivia about that chris please do dan due to alfonso curon's mexican accent it was misheard when he described that visual to the design team and they drafted a storyboard which depicted eyes falling from the sky wow that is incredible so yeah he he, you know, you... he he wanted the he wanted the train to turn to ice, and they had the train turn to eyes. That is incredible. Do you wish? Do you Could wish? Could you imagine being more? presented that storyboard though? Like, just want to. Yeah, I so, take it's a insane. second it's... to um, to just to, to to let you guys know there was a day when Alfonso Cuarón went into the post pre production offices <laughs> to look at some artwork for what they were designing. <laughs> Someone yeah, handed him a, a drawing of the train, either made out of eyes or with eyes falling from the sky. I just, I just want to make sure that everyone understands that's what happened. Because <laughs> yeah, no, it's I'm not crazy. gonna, I'm, I'm not soon gonna forget that that's what occurred. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. That's madness. As a, let's use that as a link to because well, we we got the I big questions. Help. We can, we can, we can use our big questions if we want to structure this conversation more. Now we've had our rant. <laughs> No, no. But as a first, as a first topic, Alfonso Caron. That's how you say his name. Is yes, it? yes. Um, I credit most of the amazing stuff in this. I just assume it's him. Like yes. the 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 idea with the cold and the ice. Yeah, Alfonso. Like a- any good thing, even the good performances. Yeah, well, Alfonso, 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 blo- Alfonso blocked that, didn't he? Or he told him to deliver him that way. I just automatically credit mm-hmm. him because this film so- feels so distinctly altered and it's just he's phenomenal now here's a you know i assume you would lavish him with equal praise here's a mm-hmm. question because the next the the books only get bigger from this point onwards mm-hmm. do you think do you want to delve into that alternative world where he directs more or do you think actually given the plot that has to be juggled. And by the way, my memory of Goblet of Fire is kind of similar. Some good decisions, i.e. start immediately at the Quidditch World Cup. Genius. I don't remember the... Um, what's the what's David Tennant's character's name? Uh, Barty Crouch Jr. Uh, yeah, I don't remember the Barty Crouch Jr. of it all being explained well. I think it has similar problems. We'll get yeah, there. Because we've well, we the same in, writer. That's, that's, that, so my, my, uh, my conclusion here is starting to become that the, the, the problem is, is, is close. <laughs> but yeah, carry on. Mm. Do you, do you want to delve into that world where Alfonso did more? Or do you think actually we needed to steady the ship and have some consistency? And, you know, after Mike Newell, it all going to Yates is actually probably the best thing for it. Uh, uh, I think that would come down to a person's personal taste because at a certain point we land on Yates and we stay on Yates, right? So, mm. you know, we kind of get that consistency anyway towards the end. Um, it's just a question of do we appreciate the the, 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 the the work of that director? And while I think Yates is a competent film director, um, I do think that Curon had maybe a slightly... Better. Well, there's some stuff we need to do about his choices that like um, um oh, work, but maybe don't work in the context of the whole series visually. Um, this sort of Tim Burton gothic version of of the thing he's gone for, sort of uh, is is a is a pretty extreme approach. But um, I would tell you what though. Sorry to sorry to interrupt you. Tell you what though, mate. We'll get there, but. I'll take that over the weird fucking green hue that's inexplicitly all over the half- Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. <laughs> right. 
this is my yeah. So this is what I'm getting at. Like, so the question is like, you know, w- would we have started our consistent director thing from here? Um, I, he would have never done it. I don't think Kieran. I think he's just too interested in he no. does his movie. He moves on. But um, I do think the movies would have turned out better if he'd stayed on the show. But not so much because I about the, with the concern of consistency, more about the fact that I, I don't particularly rate Yates as a director. I think he's competent, but yeah, you, cause... you know I don't think you're getting some of the scenes that are in this movie that Curon understood were, just, were were important, like the the kids messing about eating the sweets, making noises, or you know uh, Harry riding Buckbeak, or any of that stuff that we've complimented this movie for doing, which are these brilliant sort of slice of life moments from Hogwarts that aren't pushing the plot forward, but dear God, does the movie need them? You know, I, I think we'd have gotten more of that. Yeah, and, 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 imagine... and I think, you know, that's, the, that's, that's like salvaging what is otherwise a really, really chopped up version of this story. <laughs> so imagine, yeah. imagine Caron directing the Dumbledore Voldemort Ministry of Magic fight. Right. Yeah. Like that would have just been, just visually alone, that would have been stunning. Um, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. No, in answer I, to your uh, question, I, I would have had more Curon if I could have, but I, I'm I'm pretty sure he would have never done more than one movie, no matter what movie he, whether they got no. him signed on for the first one or the fifth one or whichever movie he signed on for. Uh, you know, in an alternate reality, I don't see any alternate reality where they somehow coaxed him into doing all of them. No yeah. Way. And honestly, if he's if he's only doing one, actually. Whilst, and maybe this could be our next discussion, whilst you, you've hinted at, uh, in the last few episodes, you've hinted at not liking the way the geography uh, and mm-hmm. the, some of the sets of Hogwarts changed. Um, whilst whilst there's some decisions, you know, I, we would potentially disagree with, actually, I think having someone that's going to be as bold to make... <laughs> The, the boldness of the different tone and the different uh, uses of cinematography and all of those things, I think if you have a less bold director doing the third movie, potentially it's it's a copy of Columbus or it's not quite, you know. I think you have to go, when you're going different, you have to go different. So I think this is actually as much as, I struggle with the story stuff, and as you've said, that's probably more to do with the script. I think if he's if if we're if we're only getting one Caron Harry Potter movie, I'm glad it's this one. Is what mm. I'm taking ages to say. Yeah, because I think as well, like one thing we did say with with Columbus was he brought a real light and a sort of magic to those early movies that was kind of like it was a, there was a wonder to it that Curon has replaced here with sort of gothic, scary dark vibes and i think that suits this story really well in a way i don't think it would have suited the first one so you know um but you know it's it's hard not to acknowledge the contributions though because a lot of that stuff sticks around like uh uh, you know the layout changes he makes to hogwarts some of them shift around him afterwards like some things do change but a lot of like the big as you as we've already pointed out the big bridge the fact that the Whomping Willow isn't in the courtyard anymore, Hagrid's hut being sort of part of a slope, that I'm pretty sure a lot of that stays now. And Kieran himself talked about it. Uh, you know, he said that he wanted to make the geography of Hogwarts a bit clearer, um, where you could see, where the kids are walking and they're not just walking through a plain, boring courtyard that could be swapped out for any other plain, boring courtyard. He wanted to see, like, geography and have them walking through it and then going to... Hagrid, so you could see, oh, that's how the the hut connects to the bridge, and that's how the bridge connects to Hogwarts, and that's where the courtyard mm-hmm. is, and that's how you, you know, he wanted to try and establish that, and to his credit, I think he does, I think the layout of Hogwarts is clearer in this movie than in any other, but just from my own personal thing, I, I find it very difficult to accept the geography shifting, and I know you, everyone's going, what are you talking about, Dad? It's fucking Hogwarts. It's magic. Like, the stairs move, why can't everything else... Yeah, okay, fine. If you wanna if you wanna fan explain it that way and that's that you're okay with that, that's you know, power to you. But for me the 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 the, the literal geography of the school doesn't shift. Uh, it, that's that would be a strange thing and it would make the building impossible to navigate. Um it's already difficult enough to navigate. So, mm. you know, I it's such a huge space. I, I there's you know, 
there's, it's changed because a different director came in. Because they keep it consistent for the first two, then they're pretty consistent after this one with some minor changes. So, you know, I just would have liked it to have been consistent from top to bottom, um, I guess. Um, because I, I find it... Especially because the t- this movie and the movie right before it both heavily feature the Whomping Willow, and it's so clearly in a different place and looks different and behaves different. I just think that's... You sort of scratching your head as to what's happened you know it's 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 almost as jarring as the recast of dumbledore or the redesign of flitwick you know it's it's and i and i'll get to the redesign of flitwick later in the trivia because that's a an interesting thing because it wasn't supposed to be a redesign of flitwick it got retroactively made one it's really interesting we'll come to it um yeah let's so, before before we do before we do questions let's yes. do let's do dumbledore because obviously yeah uh incredibly tragic circumstances um we lost richard harris i actually i i we were discussing um my cousin's a big harry potter fan and we were discussing the the dumbledore of it all and uh you know could richard harris have done the menacing uh and it's interesting because uh, the older people that were present um said go go and watch some of his earlier films they did give the caveat he was younger obviously but they talked about you know some of those uh, some of his earlier films him having this huge presence and they felt he could have done those those scenes um which i thought was a, an interesting uh take but obviously we unfortunately live in a world where we didn't get to see that um in terms of uh michael gambon i think i i was surprised on this rewatch how <laughs> The, the seeds of there's a bit too much edge to his performance, a bit too much sharpness to his be- performance oh, were so already bad. present in this film. My Sorry, say that again. I was just saying awful. It's so bad. Yeah, go on. I'm and just, I, I'm, I, I'm, I, I'm, 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 the listeners can't see me, but I'm shaking my head right now. <laughs> my, mem- yeah. my memory was that that came later. That that, you know, the big one always, people always turn to is the Goblet of Fire. You know, and there's that meme of like he <laughs> a said Dumbledore calmly. asked calmly. And, yeah. yeah. So in my head, it it kind of there were flashes in Goblet, and then it really became a thing uh, in Order and Half Blood Prince. But it's here; it's already here. Like there's just there's no twinkle. There's no, you know, the stuff. Well, maybe two innocent lives. It sounds like threatening. It's uh, yeah. It's it's. He doesn't even seem pleased when they do it, when they achieve it and save him. Like, it's crazy. It, look, I, I'm I'm forced to accept here that this isn't just miscasting. This is a an actor making bad choices. I I can't. Do, I, I I look. Michael Gambon's a wonderful actor. I've seen him be amazing in many many roles. Um, and while I do think he was miscast massively here, at a certain point, he has a responsibility to understand what. What the what what's written on the page and what is it required of him, um, and you know, I don't think either they didn't put enough in the script for him to get the character. He certainly hasn't read the books. I know, and I know that that's he's he said that he's he's he saw no point apparently in reading the books to get an idea of Dumbledore. Every part I play is just a variant of my own personality, is the quote. So he just never read them. He just went off the scripts, and, uh, but. So even if you're going, okay, well, he's making his own interpretation based on what's on the page, but he's not even delivering what's on the page as I think it's supposed to be delivered. You know, what's written on the page, it gives off that on its own, gives off that vibe of like the twinkle in the eye or whatever, but he just, every single line he delivers, I just want to rip my own skin off. It's awful, awful. And again, not helped by genuinely dreadful dialogue. There's a point in this movie where Dumbledore does a little bit of a speech about, what is it? It's, 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 oh, I wrote it down. It's really random. It's when they're all sleeping. Oh, dreams. He just has a lovely little speech about the importance of dreams or something. And it's like, it's supposed to, I, I guess, indicate... I, I guess it's supposed to sort of give us a glimpse of this new Dumbledore, like, being thoughtful or whatever. But it's just fucking weird and it's delivered badly. Um, it was written poorly. It was then misunderstood and performed poorly. And it's just nothing about it works. Nothing about any scene that Dumbledore is in in this movie works. Not nothing, zero, absolutely zero. Um, it's a it's a shocking development, and, and there are you know it's it, it's it's even worse than I remember, and that is saying something. <laughs> that is saying something. 
What so have show. you have you got a and let's let's do it, you know, at the time, not now. Is there anyone you think of that could have done it? I mean, I, I th- there was a lot of talk, I think, and I think they even approached Ian McKellen. And while I do think it's too close to what he's already done, he's good at that. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. That You know, when you think about when we just reviewed those movies, keep in mind, think about the little twinkle his Gandalf has in his eyes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think I, I, uh, you know the two. Uh, it, yeah. Is it giving the same actor essentially the same role twice? Yeah. I, to some degree, yeah. But you know what? If he's that fucking good at it, is that the end of the world? If I get a good performance out of it at the end of the day, does it matter? You know. Yeah. I. D- yeah. I've. I've got. I've got an alternative that I think isn't too close though. And I okay. Think yeah. Um, oh, please. Um, I. I. Because I, um, I. I keep going back to that. But I. I. I admit. I'm. That's a. That's a bias created by him being so good at Gandalf. But go on. What's yeah. the. Uh, what's the alternative? Well, I, Charles Dance. Ah. Um, yes. Because I. I think Charles Dance. Think about Charles Dance reading the reading the bad celebrity autobiographies on the big quiz. But also think about Charles Dance in Game of Thrones, Lost. Do you know what I mean? I I think I've seen examples of him twinkle and threaten, and both have been great. <laughs> like so, yeah, Charles. Yeah, Charles I think, you, Dance cra- I think a, you cracked the code. I thought I, I think that's who they needed to cast. I'm looking at pictures of him from that era as well. I just get, just did a bit of a quick sneaky Google. And he mm. looks he looks old, but yet also you believe. He could yep. move. <laughs> yep, yep. Well, he probably could by then. Because remember, this is... He probably could now. Because we, we, well, we, just, we just saw him in Last Action Hero, didn't we? Which is 93. And he was basically mm. a middle-aged, like, youngish man, right? He was the villain. He was, he was pretty spry. He wasn't like an older guy. So this is only, what, mm. 10 years after that? You know, add 10 years yep. to that guy. <sighs> I think you've cracked it, Chris. I was very pleased when I thought of it. And I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna save that. You know what's even more Daniel frustrating? Mm. I think he worked with Daniel Radcliffe before the Harry Potter movies. Oh, did he? Yeah, I think he was in that Nicol- not Nicholas Nickel. Was it Nicholas Nickel? I'll give it a look. Oh wait, no, no, no. I'm mixing it up. He was in Nicholas Nickleby. Daniel Radcliffe was in the other one. I've mixed up my two, my two things. I can't think of the name of the other one, but I know it's... Danny Radcliffe uh, in, like, Oliver Twist or something? No, 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 it's... Oh, it's on the tip of my tongue. They did a movie recently with Dev Patel. Uh, I don't know, I'll look it up. Rather David than... I've Cop- just Googled Charles David Copperfield. Dance, David, Harry David, David Copperfield. Personal history David, David Copperfield. Copperfield. That's it. So, yeah. so they did... I think they did a David Copperfield one where Daniel Radcliffe was in, and then they did... Around the same time, they did Nicholas Nickleby with Charles Dance, which is why I've got pictures of in front of me. But, um... Yeah, no, that's. I think you figured it out. That's who, exactly who they should have cast from minute one. Show, shall we do questions, Dan? Yeah, so we got the we we'll do the big questions. For those who don't know, to ke- keep these discussions from getting too unwieldy, and this one already has, so we're a bit late on these. Maybe we'll introduce the questions. We've got three or four. We got four, or four, four, maybe five questions here um, that I wrote down after doing the first episode that we should ask of all of these movies. Um, and we'll, 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 the first two we've kind of covered, but it'd be nice to get a clearer, summed up version of our thoughts on this. Um, does it work as a story on its own? And then I've got in brackets a natural and logical sequence of events without the need for extra context from the books. Now, I you would think I wrote that with this film in mind, having just reviewed it, but I wrote that after watching Philosopher's Stone. <laughs> so <laughs> um, that's an amazing I, I... thing to have written, considering what we, what the situation we're in here is. <laughs> I think the answer is no, I... right? <laughs> I don't know, man. It does function. You said it yourself. We have both said it functions. We've literally used those words. Right, but then I don't I've got like the same... natural and logical sequence of events without the need for the extra context of the books. I oh, think no, when you not watch natu- this... it's not a natural. Yeah, it's not a natural logical sequence. I, 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 I think. Yeah, I think that's why this is such a hard movie to pin down because the first part of the question it absolutely is: Does it work as a story on its own? Yes, but is it a natural and logical sequence of events without the need for extra context? Um, no, because the, the yeah, it, 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 there is so much 
weirdness in this movie and and i and again i think that's why this movie does continue to work for, for a lot of people is regardless of like your knowledge because you just you just go with it otherwise if you just don't think about it too hard it's perfectly logical like, you just can't think about it, it too hard <laughs> Why does it end on the fireball? Like, because like, taking the fireball out and the mystery of the fireball out is great because it saves time setting up that. Why do that if you're not going to do Quidditch? And it makes sense to just go right into it for that Quidditch scene. So, yeah. you know, I get taking the fireball out. Why do we need to end on the fireball? Yeah, instead like, of ending such on, a on, weird... on Sirius sending Harry his signed permission slip, which yeah, is how the book ends. That's better. You've set that up. You've 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 dealt with that. And I, yeah. that's actually linking into my answer to what I think is the second question. So let's, let's go second question. Um, can you see the seams of where things have been cut out? Oh, that's not what I thought the second what question was. What did you think the second um, question was? But, is it about how magic is portrayed? or uh, Is there enough school is, in my wizard school movie? Is, is there another school? So let's, let's, do, let's change the order a little bit. Is there enough school in my wizard school movie? Right. Yes. I'm going to say to this. Yeah. And sorry, do you give your answer? No, no. I was just saying. I was agreeing with you. I'm, Were you going to do this question? Yes. Let's do this one. I'm curious. Go on. I'm going to say. <laughs> I'm going to say no, but yes. So <laughs> no, there isn't enough school. But the decision to focus on Hogsmeade and making everyone disappearing off to Hogsmeade a representation of how how that makes Harry feel. The use of, you know, the shots with that constant swinging clock that acts as <laughs> yep. a motif for the entire film, which is just another great filmmaking decision. But mm-hmm. I think I think the decision to make Hogsmeade such a part of this film is, is the right decision for this film. So although there isn't technically by any means enough school, I think that what they did instead of, instead of school is a feature in the books that they've chosen to keep and it does work for this film. So yeah, it kind of is there enough the, school the second it, half of this movie it feels like it just takes place on their weekends. Yeah, but again that I I understand it more than previous movies. At no point was I going why is this scene set in a courtyard? This scene could be set in a lesson. Um so yeah, I think if the if the question is phrased as is there the right amount of school? Yeah. It's an interesting question For as me. well. What about you? Well, yeah, cuz it's interesting isn't it because the beginning of the movie, they do do a fair amount of lessons because they keep doing that and trust me guys, if you don't think we've got onto the if we if you think we're missing the time travel stuff, oh, believe me, we'll come into it. Um there <laughs> there's uh, yeah, <laughs> we've got some we've got some things we've got to talk about there. But um, it, you know, it, you know, assuming that we're but we do load we do do several lessons early in the movie because we have Hermione keep popping up right, so they keep having to do lessons. So it, it, sort of first act, you know, we see him in divination, we see him in. Um, uh, Defense Against the Dark Arts. We do that a couple of times because we have the Defense Against the Dark Arts lesson that's run by Snape. Excuse me. Um, we see Hagrid's first lesson. Um, can we completely skip Charms and Herbology and McGonagall's Transfiguration class this year? Um, and we actually miss potions as well. Not <laughs> second year in a row. Not we have had no potions lesson depicted in this series. Since the first, his, since we showed Harry's first ever potions lesson in the first year, Snape Snape is a presence you can place wandering the halls, and that's a bit more menacing. And so you know, I yeah. see why we've had less potions than but like, McGonagall. When, yeah, for sure. But like at the same time, you know, you want to see him bullying Harry in lessons. That's when he gets Harry trapped yes. and does most of his bullying in the books. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's very true. I um, also on lessons. Uh, fucking, I'm not going nuts, am I, mate? Divination is set like in the top of the tower of the divination tower, which you have to go up a cramped staircase and peer in. Mm-hmm. Like they actively have stairs in the divination classroom that suggest it's in some sort of basement, and that wound me up. Like, Did they really? Because because no, because we. Sh- because in the scene where Harry goes back in and he gets Trelawney's thing, we see him going upstairs to get there. 
Well, maybe they bend down then, but I don't know. Let me see if I can Google it. And I've got it up in front of me. I'm just going to flick through it and see if I can find it. So here's the first divination lesson. Um. Yeah, to me, the stairs are going down into the room. Yeah, but that doesn't no, mean that the room can... is at the is is at the bottom of stairs. No, it, and you could argue the stairs are going up to a platform, basically, aren't they? By the looks yeah. of it, so yeah, and it's not even so much stairs; it's more like staggered seating. Yeah. Okay. All right. And then if you go, if you if you skip to another uh, an earlier part of the movie, a later part of the movie, when Harry gets the ball from divination and goes back in. Ah, I see what's throwing you, Chris. Later in the movie, there's a scene when you can see a staircase that goes up in the back of one of the shots. I believe, I could be wrong, but I believe that's the staircase to um, Trelawney's personal um, right, living, okay, living quarters. Fine. Yeah, that is um, that staircase I'm specifically talking about, the ones, not the raised seating, the, the stairs that to me made it, I interpreted them as stairs down into the room. But you're no, right, no, they those could stairs, be stairs are up, up to, into a, to a further room, room, I believe. But yeah. uh, later in the movie, there's a big, big spiral staircase, and uh, Harry and Ron are going down it, and he finds the uh, the 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 the, the, uh, the ball, the crystal ball, and he right, takes fine. it back up the stairs into divination, and you can see the staircase and the the door of the divination class, and it's clearly an, you go up to the tower. Um, so it's it which is, is then that is laid have, out correctly, which is where we have a this is this is purely like this is complete personal feelings bias etc. You know sometimes with adaptations and specifically adaptations you love you have a moment of that's not how I saw it in my mind. Like Emma Thompson's reading of of the of the prophecy is great. Like it's a it's you know a choice or direction or whatever. But me personally, I'm just it's a bit like the Dobby thing last week. I'm just like I can't help but every time I see that scene go, that's not what it, in my mind it's whispery and 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 it, uh, um what's the not o- 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 ominous? It's whispery and ominous. It's not this sort of gruff, rah, like yeah, I don't, I don't like that. But that's interesting because I always, I always preference. kind of leaned my 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 vision of it was always closer. It was closer to what she does. So yeah, but I'll that. be honest with you, mate. It makes more sense what she does. Like, I'll be honest. Like, it's it. Yeah, that, what, how, that how makes the book describes yeah. it. Maybe I'll have a flick for it through in a minute. Um, but yeah, so I think if we're doing the questions in terms of the school. Uh, there is actually a lot, a fair bit of school. It's just all front loaded, so it, the film feels a bit uneven for all the school that happens in my school movie. Yeah, yeah, so, because yeah. I was, we were wrong. Although mainly it was me, I was wrong. There's more, there's way more robes in this than I remember. They're in robes, for, like you say, front loaded, but they're in robes for a lot of it. So yeah, I'll and I, back, I really I like the choice complaint. as well to let them vary their their uniforms now, because mm. in a real school. The kids, they're kids. You just, you, they, they don't dress the same. They'll all personalize it. They'll, some of them do that weird thing with the tie where it's really short. Some of them will have their shirts hanging out. Some of them will have them tucked in. You know, it's the the whole point of the uniform is to make everyone look like dress like identically to sort of stamp out that sort of stuff and create a certain sense of like, I don't know, not responsibility, but you know, like a certain sort of. Um, it's like it's the same reason we make the army guys, you know, wear a uniform. Like it's it's I don't know, it's it's like a. A rigidity to it, a procedure, but it never works with children. They always customize, shift, and shuffle. And this is the first movie where, if you just find a shot from the movie, Chris, or whether in a class, particularly, it's not most no, it's noticeable when they're uh, doing Hagrid's class, where some of them are wearing the robe part, some of them aren't, so they just got the shirt and tie. Some of them have like a jumper over that. Hermione is not wearing her robe or her jumper, so her time turner is just swinging around her neck for all to see. Completely visible throughout the entire scene. Yeah, that made me laugh a lot. I, like, it just was like, is her time turner always on display? And I was like, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so the weird. whole movie. So, in terms of the um, one thing I, I will say for the, is the, the Curran's decision to let the kids do that, and apparently that's what happened. He just like was like, yeah, it's fine. Like they can, they don't all have to, you know, 
they customize a little. It, it does give it a lot more variation. And I think that does almost make it feel more authentically school, even though I'm not seeing a lot of lessons and I'm learning a lot of stuff. Like, so yeah. Um, I, I think they get away with it in this one more so than the other two. Even though I don't actually think we spend any more time or, or less time in school than the other one. Um, I don't have That's as many fair. thoughts on Thanks. this movie on this question, Chris, but it's been a big question in the other one, so let's uh, let's see if we can tackle it, and I'll, I'll, I'll pass it to you for this one. Um, how do you feel magic was portrayed in this movie? Well, there's... Sorry, spells. I, I may have been if, very cruel to just if, throw that at you without any warning. Yeah, 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 yeah. I haven't. I've thought about it and don't have an answer. So I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you no time to think about it and see if you've got an answer, Chris. <laughs> so, but I think I do. So, if you define magic as spells, there's not a lot of spell work in this film. But mm-hmm. again, not to keep you know praising Alfonso and crediting him for everything. Uh. Harry and Hermione traveling back through time. Beautiful, logical, magical visual. Uh, Peter turning from rat to Timothy Spool. Great magical vision. Uh, the night bus weaving in and out of traffic and and going and going thin and inwards as it goes as it goes through the two other buses. Great, you know what I mean. So. There's not a lot of interesting, fun spell work, particularly, but there's a lot of great mm-hmm. visuals that represent what magic is. Aunt Petunia, Aunt, Aunt Petunia, e- easily could be is it a scene in a movie that was made in what two thousand and three or whenever it was. I, that we I assume back you, keep, on that. you keep you keep referring to it as Aunt Petunia. I assume you mean Aunt Marge. Oh, sorry, yeah, Aunt Marge. Sorry, apologies. Yeah, I just I just Aunt clarified because like I wasn't sure the first time, and now I'm like. No, because if he's talking about magic, Petunia definitely isn't involved in any magic, so he must be... Yes, sorry, yeah, all all, all, all the way along I've meant Aunt Marge, apologies. Um, The, you know, her, her, her expanding and exploding, you know, we could, there'd be films with similar effects made at the same time that we'd be looking back and now going, yeah, so I mean, it's not aged brilliantly, but, you know, still, but that's aged fine, like that, that, that works, it looks great, so... It's spell work, not really represented, but magic, I think, is done well. Uh, mainly because of the, the visuals uh, crafted by, you know, Alfonso Caron and the team. Yeah, and I think, I think you're right, because I think most of the time when we've talked about how is magic portrayed, you know, we've been looking for, like, consistency with use of spells. We're, we're looking for warning signs of the uh, sparkle guns that the, the ones become. You know, we've been talking about, like, consistency. I mean, the fact that Harry doesn't do magic in the entire first movie. This is the sort of stuff I've, we've been coming at. And this movie doesn't really fall into any of those traps for a couple of reasons. I mean, the main one being there isn't a huge amount of wizard-on-wizard wizard magic in this. The magic in this movie is mostly contextual, uh, sort of, in-world magic. So something like the night bus... Um, you know, or like I don't know, like the staircases moving at Hogwarts, or the Whomping Willow, or uh, magical creatures like Buckbeak, and and that all that stuff's all great, and it's hard to kind of get that stuff wrong. I guess the only real instance of um, spell, like use spells used on wizards in this movie, is really uh, when Snape comes in and Expelliarmus's Lupin, which works exactly how it should. The wand just pops straight out of his hand, but they then and I was like, you know what, it's Chris. I've never known. Uh, myself to like cheer and then boo within 30 seconds so snape pops in expelliarmus lupin's wand pings right out of his hand with a really satisfying white little pop it looked great really pleased with that i was like god that's how expelliarmus should look in all these goddamn movies that's really cool and then harry goes expelliarmus and snape gets knocked over with a big ball of white sparkles again and i was like how you just got this right 10 seconds ago that's an example again of I don't know why that's changed from the book because in the book Harry Harry Ron and Hermione all expel armor Snape and that's why he gets knocked I, out. I, I I do. It's because in the book you have the time to explain all three of them starting to feel that Snape's becoming unreasonable, regardless of their thoughts on the Scabbers situation. 
Snape's just clearly in it for Revenge of Black. They all start to sense that. They realise that no one's going to get to the truth if they just keep down this path with Snape. And and they they all have lines of dialogue that explain how they get there, right? Personally. You know, Ron's the last one to reach that conclusion, I think, because he's the one that thinks a lot of this is mad. But Ron and... Uh, but Hermione and Harry very quickly become like, no, we... There is definitely something going on here we need answers to. And if Snape just gets to take Sirius back, we're never going to find out. So, you they, you know, you have the time to do that. The movie does not, sadly. So I don't necessarily yes, mind that but, change of but, Harry being yeah, the one to but, do it. But then it doesn't make sense that Snape collapses into a lump. <laughs> so, I, I agree with your explanation completely. But the fact that... Harry, the fact that Hermione and Ron haven't had the motivation to feel that way to do it is a nuance that the film is not bothered about in other regards in these in these specific scenes. So, like, I can see, I can see where you're coming from. I think that probably is the explanation. But why are they not so worried about justifying Harry wanting to live with Sirius and all that sort of stuff? Right. Well, that's my thing. So, they, what they've done is they've correctly identified you don't have the time to get into why Harry and uh, sorry Hermione and Ron get on side so you can't have them zapping Snape fine okay you've you've found a thing you can cut that will have little com- you know complications then don't have Harry use Expelliarmus we know what that spell does you've just shown us have Harry use Stupefy or anything it doesn't matter make up a spell knock her, knock her over us and Snape goes flying I don't give a shit consistency, please, with the spells. That's all I'm asking for with, from these fucking movies. And that's not that fucking hard. Expelliarmus, what does that do? Knocks your wand out your hand. Well, that's not appropriate for this situation because we need Harry to knock Snake off on his ass. All right. Snapeacus knock Assacus. Fine. I don't care. I leave. Does not matter. <laughs> it just can't be the same spell we just saw doing something different. I, like, I can't... How is this so fucking hard? <laughs> it's not. Yeah. It's really not. I'm not a smart person, <laughs> and I can solve this problem in a blink of an eye. How are all these what? talented filmmakers looking at these scripts and doing these movies and going, and how did no one at any point in any of this production go, isn't that the same spell Snape just used to a, to a very different effect? Like, no one said that at all? <laughs> what? <laughs> so infuriating, no, Chris. What what's what's the next question, Dad? Uh, the next question um, is there enough school in my wizard school movie? How is magic portrayed? And the final question in the questions is: Is Daniel Radcliffe good yet? We could probably erase this question after this movie because I think this is this is because I th- I think he's hugely improved in the second movie, um, but maybe not still quite up to the standard of his colleagues. But very, very good. Just a couple of scenes and a couple of diet line reads that are just like uh, slightly a hint of what we used to have from you in this. But this is the movie where it's like I, f- almost flawless. Like I can't, I, what a good, really good performance from such a young actor. It's remarkable. He's very, very good at this movie. I think. What did you think? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think he's. I think he's very strong in this. I think his uh, and. He's got some shit dialogue, <laughs> like, and he's he's really doing his best. And he, yeah, I think he's I think he's good. I think we can say Prisoner of Azkaban. Daniel Radcliffe is uh, is officially good. There you go, Daniel Radcliffe officially good. I was having a look, Chris. I was trying to find the moment where Trelawney says her. Uh... Oh, here we go. Found it. Uh, Harry got up, picked up his bag and turned to go, but then a loud, harsh voice spoke behind him. It will happen tonight. Harry wheeled around. Trelawney had gone rigid in the armchair, her eyes unfocused and her mouth sagging. Sorry, said Harry, but Trelawney didn't seem to hear him. Her eyes started to roll. Wow. This is actually better than what's in the movie. (laughs) Because her eyes start to roll and stuff. That's way more upsetting than just her being in his face. Yeah, the key the key thing is I'm I'm definitely my interpretation is definitely wrong. A harsh voice alone, it's like oh well I'm I'm like it's like the Dobby thing. I'm just picturing something different. <laughs> like that's yeah, like, like I said, very personal issue. <laughs> Professor Trolley spoke again in the same harsh voice, quite unlike her own. Yeah, in this yeah in the harsh voice, it's used twice. So yeah, it's pretty clear. Yeah, um, but, you know, um, um, it's it's one of those things though where like stuff like that is like, you know, we, it's what we got nitpick corner for, right? Like, Nitpick Corner for me, well, let's, you know, fuck it, we can live in Nitpick Corner during this 
<laughs> during these movies. I reckon. I think these. I think this series. Oh yeah. I think, I yeah. Think and broadcasting live from Nitpick Corner, <laughs> Harry Potter and the Rewind and, Reviews. <laughs> and that you know that notion of um, that's a thing when dealing with adaptations, isn't it? You know, something being different than it is in in people's mm-hmm. head. Um, let's Dan. Let's and I'm going to let you take the lead on this one. Let's talk about time travel, baby. Yes. Let's talk about time travel. So, Chris and I are both very fond of time travel stories. And we both actually, through complete coincidence, because we both came at it from different times and different you know perspectives, when we, when we met at uni, we very quickly discovered we both have a very similar preference when it comes to time travel stories, which is a theory that kind of got, I think, m- most explained clearly in the TV show Lost, which is the it's it's the phrase we use when we refer to this kind of time travel now, which is it's whatever happened happened time travel. And what that means is you've you're already living in the timeline created by your future self's actions in the past. You can't go back and change the future because you already are from that you're you're living in that future and you know it didn't work. Whatever you're already living in the product of your your changes, basically. You were already there in the past and already did those things. You just didn't know it yet. So, for example, I could go back to um and uh, you know to to like six months ago and and try to stop myself from agreeing to do these podcasts <laughs> or suggesting that we do these podcasts. But I already know that for whatever reason, I failed. Because that's, we're doing these that's podcasts. The, that's either just, either can I just say, didn't listen. <laughs> Go on. Can I can I just say I can try and convince you I can try and convince you to not do these podcasts, but I know it's happened already. Just encompasses the last ten years of my life. <laughs> <laughs> just, just a sense of well, that's written. I'm doing it, aren't I? <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> very good enjoyed that I jest I jest good work um, so for me like that that's a, the, the established idea of if you go back in time you're already living in the future that is produced by those choices so you you either already know you failed or succeeded based on what happened so in the context of this Harry Potter story the time travel element for those who do not recall the third act of this movie and book which we haven't really talked about yet we'll get to now, is that uh, Ron, and, uh, Ron, Hermione and Harry get into the situation where they learn the truth about the Marauders, t- attempt to get Pettigrew back to the castle to prove the Sirius is a uh, is, is, is innocent of those murders that we've not given context to. Fine, whatever. I, I could say, do that all day. Um, on their way back, unfortunately, Lupin, having not taken his uh, moon potion, which again, not established in the movie, just through that one line. Did you take your po- potion tonight, Lupin? <laughs> All right, cool. I think I think Snape says you didn't take your potion. I think someone says it. There's one line. There's there's, there's 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 it's one line. Someone utters. I don't know who. I had the script up. Let me see if it's in there. Oh uh, yeah, sorry. Carry on. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I can't remember who says it, but someone does say it. But it's one line. It's just a barely a, like established or explained. But whatever. Fine. He turns into a werewolf. Um, or a, a weird skin, hairless skin, Siamese cat creature, and um, starts attacking everyone. It's a bad special effect. Um, it's a terrible design. It needs to die immediately. Um, <laughs> it's so, so bad. But it has a fight with Sirius. It all gets a bit messed up. Harry goes after Sirius to try and save him, but he's already being put upon by the Dementors. Um, Harry tries to save him from the Dementors, fails miserably, and as they're both about to have their souls removed... Um, a, a Patronus charm charges through in the shape of a stag and the day is saved. The Then we wake up in the hospital wing and Sirius is being caught and is about to be have his soul removed up in the tower and Harry is like I'm pretty sure my dad just came and saved me and what then happens is it turns out Hermione has time travel powers she's had them all year to go to her lessons and to, to get to all the different lessons we use the powers to um Save Buckbeak and use Buckbeak to go save Sirius, basically. But it, during that, Harry decides that he wants to go see who cast the Patronus, thinking it's his dad, and realizes it was never his dad, it was always him. 
and Harry turns up and does the Patronus, saving his past self and then going off to save present Sirius. Um, if that sounds complicated, it makes more sense when you watch either the movie or the book. And I think, for the la- for the most part, the third act of the movie is very faithful to the third act of the book, and it makes a lot of sense, and it all works. They've even added some extra hints to the time travel earlier, such as the stone going through the window uh, and, and revealing scabbers and alerting them to the oncoming things. That, that's all fine. I, I don't mind any of that. All works, as far as I'm concerned. Loops around perfectly. I do have some concerns about Hermione just appearing in Lessons throughout the movie mm. because I'm, tr- I'm I'm trying to make sense of the logic of this so to compare and contrast in the uh, novelization of this film that happens to have been released prior to it <laughs> just through coincidence <laughs> um, she's often talking about lessons that she can't have possibly been to because she was just with Harry and Ron. On the, on their first day back, she's already got a, a, a arithmancy homework, despite the fact that she's been with Ron and Harry in their first two lessons and hasn't been to an arithmancy class yet. This is how they do it in the book. There is also an, there's also an incident where Hermione misses a lesson altogether. And she's like, oh, I can't believe I missed that. I got, so I just got jumbled up. I was so frustrated after she had, she, I think that's the day she hits Malfoy, basically, in the book. So she's just all frustrated after that and she makes a mistake. They don't really understand how she could have missed a lesson. Like, what was she doing at that time? Doesn't make sense to them. There is also um, a couple of instances where they, they're they pretty sure she's just behind them and then she isn't. Which is the closest the book gets to doing what the movie does. But that's just an, a, a, you know, a, a, a trait of her in in the in the book, it's kind of makes sense because she's had she's she's gone off to her other lesson back in time, <laughs> so she's that's why she's had to leave. Like uh, she, that, you know, it, it, it sort of tracks in the book. In the movie, we literally see that they're in the lesson, and it's just Harry and Ron at the table, and then we cut to the teacher talking, and then when we come back. She sat at the table. I'm sorry. What the fuck are you doing, movie? Because for this to work, she would have to go back to before the lesson and enter with the boys to, you know, to enjoy the entire class. Not just appear in the class. Because essentially what they're suggesting she's done is that she's finished her arithmancy class, run off to the divination tower, sat down in the seat, and done the time turner to appear in the past. That is the most fucking haphazard... Risky way to do time travel I've ever fucking heard in my life, if that's what she's doing. Because that's a fucking great way to get caught. Reappear in front of everyone. (laughs) It's the least subtle way to do it. But also, why wouldn't you just go back further and then just do the whole class? So either the time travel doesn't make sense in this movie, or Hermione's an idiot. And I don't like either answer. (laughs) Yeah. Because, again, she's either doing it badly, which is why she's popping into class... Or, the whole idea is, oh, suddenly we're changing the, the, the time travel from it, whatever happened always happened to, from Harry and Ron's perspective, sometimes she just is there for the second half of the class, but they don't remember her being there in the first half of the class, which is shit. So, pick your poison. Hermione's either irresponsible and stupid, which is deeply out of character for both the book and the movie version, or the time travel, which makes perfect sense in the final act of the movie, doesn't make sense throughout the first two. I like to fansplain it by saying that it, from their perspective, she's just popping up. But actually, you know, if the camera were to pan round further or a couple of minutes earlier, we'd see her walk through the door, etc. I'm saying it's fansplaining. So, what, so, so, so she's turning up late to all the classes, is what you're saying? Yeah. Even though she has the ability in. of time travel, she's still coming in late. Hey. I'm fans waiting for a, yeah, but, a you're, you're, but, but your fan explanation <laughs> comes with the same problem of it makes Hermione seem deeply irresponsible. <laughs> yeah, I didn't say I was fan explaining well. I just said I was fan explaining. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't know. I, I don't know because you, you you know you're you're a big time travel guy like me, Chris. Uh, is this, did this bother you as you were watching the film, or did you not really? Did it not really? Uh, it didn't. It didn't occur to me, but it does. I can completely see your frustration, and I'm sure if I watch this film again, it will bother me then. Yeah. For sure. It bothered me more that it's this precious thing that she's been given and it's just round her neck visible for the entire film. Yeah, but see, I, that doesn't bother me too much because, like, if... if, if cause, cause the, my thought on that is just that, like, a time, how commonly known are time turners? 
Does everyone know Time Turners exist? That doesn't seem likely. If there's just a small number of them and they're all at the Ministry, <laughs> every single one, and they're kept under wraps, you know, it's just a it's just a necklace, right? To the to the to the average Hogwarts student. Fair. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, that's true. And you know, you're, you're, I, uh... you're you know, you're also an arbiter of whatever happened happened. You're also a, a, a fan of that version of time travel. So I, I figured you'd have as much of a problem with that as I did, but maybe not. No, 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 I do. No, 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 I just didn't, I just, I'm not going to pretend I noticed it, but now that you've pointed it out, yeah, because it implies, it just doesn't make any sense, her just popping up, like, especially when in most cases there's, it's more logical to, you know, but, but I do get, like, you know, it's, it's less, it's less easy in the movies to do, you're late again, where have you been? Well, no, I suppose it isn't. It, it is that. Instead of Ron being like, She's appeared out of nowhere. It's what's going on with you? You're acting weird. Why are you keep? Why do you keep being late? Why? But she's. But she's. But in the book, she's not late. She's only misses a lesson once. She's never late because she has time travel. That's the point. In the book, yeah, you have to. The, you have her to, schedule you, doesn't make sense. Yeah, but you, what's what's the alternative? You just you have to do some sort of yeah, yeah. what's going on with Hermione. So yeah, so what you do is what you what you do what they did in the book, which is have Hermione in their first lesson say, which is Trelawney, say, oh, my arithmancy class was far better than d- stupid divination. And Ron go, you can't have done arithmancy yet. That was our first lesson of the day. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Like, yeah, that, I didn't fine. notice it, but it is it is a problem. Yeah, you're or right. if you want a visual, the visual version of it, no problem. Do that too. Happens in the book where that where she when, the, when she gets frustrated the day that she hits Malfoy, she loses track of it, and there they as far as they're concerned, she's just behind them as they're heading into a lesson, and then she's gone because she's gotten muddled up and used the time turner wrong and only gone to one of the two lessons she was supposed to be at and didn't use it again to go back, which makes perfect sense and it's. They're, they're walking into a classroom with her with them, and then when they go to sit down, she isn't anymore. And then later on, they go, Hermione, why didn't you make it to Charms? She's like, oh, no, I'm so annoyed at myself. Perfect, do that. Because it's cool, visual, where she vanishes. It doesn't break the time travel. It doesn't make Hermione look incompetent, because they do it specifically on a day when she's having a rough time. I, I, it's just This is one of those times where, like, what were they gaining by changing it? I, I, I like I, so often. I think changes are important because you changes how the story works and stuff, or it changes like how you can visually represent something instead of, you know, uh, verbally. But this is one of those things that just doesn't need to be changed. There's no benefit to changing it. It only makes it more confused, um, and that's a, that's that was very frustrating for me because um, again, I'm all, all for adaptions making changes to smooth these things out. That is is the opposite. That's bad. <laughs> no yeah, good. I hear what you're saying. Yeah, mm. I think that's fair. I hear what you're saying. Um, the I I have the uh, the script here, and it's reminding me of something. So you're right. It's <laughs> it's serious. Remus, my old friend, have you taken your potion tonight? There that's it is. The yeah. only time. That's the only time the word potion appears yep. according to this dialogue transcript. Uh-huh. Um, but I do have to say, <laughs> si- serious it's trying to so cut. So silly. I know. I know. The, and and you could. You know, because they do have the whole Hermione caught the lesson. We even see the fucking lesson, you know. Anyway. Um, the oh, it's so good. Um, <laughs> I will so say, good. though, again, the movie the movie gives with what the movie takes with one hand and gives with the other. It's reminded me that that scene where Sirius is trying to stop him um, and saying, you know, the man you truly are, Remus, the heart is where you truly live here. And he's like grabbing onto his chest mm-hmm. and his where his heart is, is and stuff is, is brilliant. Like that was a fantastic scene. That's another example of a great moment in this film. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? That's that's some dialogue that's actually not terrible from this, which is, you know, well, that's the that's the thing. You know, what's frustrating about this movie is the dialogue's all really good when it's very like personal and like you know characters talking about how they feel the dialogue is always terrible in this movie whenever they're trying to explain plot stuff and Mm. considering all of this you know adapting these very complex well maybe not very complex but like condensing these books down into a movie is always going to be complex even if the book is simple just because it's two into one sort of thing you know um if the if the writer you've chosen to do this adaptation is not capable of doing really good clean expositional dialogue, 
<laughs> he might be the wrong man for the job. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Mm. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I, I'm starting to think the real the real villain of the piece, uh, just in terms of like where this where this series goes wrong, might very well be the <laughs> well be close. Because also. I think one of the reasons we think that dialogue is so good is Gary Oldman being a wonderful actor. Because you know the man you truly are, Remus. The heart is where you truly live here. That, you know, that could also be read in a way which seems like bad dialogue. I mean, you know, truly is repeated a couple of words apart, for ex- for example. So, yeah. And you know what? Let's We'll see. Because um, Cloves wrote all of these movies except one. So we'll be able to prove or disprove that theory um, when we get to uh, Phoenix. Mm. What? Uh, and what that's the, the biggest got... book. That's the most difficult book to cut down. I'm, it's the, I'm, it's I'm excited to watch the... Phoenix because I, I kind of really remember where I sit on the other films. And I know a lot of people really rate Phoenix, but I, I don't really remember either from first time or rewatching. I think I really enjoyed it. I think I don't know. So I'm, yeah, I'm excited to watch Phoenix to sort of discover how I feel about it. I, I feel like Phoenix has a lot of the like teenage drama and the the love stuff that's fun, um, and they do a lot of that. And I, I remember that being quite enjoyable. And obviously, yeah, and you action, know, as a as and a villain, a- what's her face is just. So much fun to see in live action. Yeah, and, Sunbridge. and the the teenage love stuff was, you know, actually fun. Whereas in Half Blood Prince, everyone is horny. <laughs> like it's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, so these are notes, um, otherwise known yeah. as in the book. Um, well, this is just me having a bit of a whinge. Uh, where did Harry fo- get the photo of his parents? Did they do the scene in the first movie where Hagrid gives him the the, the book of photos? Because if not, uh, I, I've got um, where, where where did he get that from? I think they did do that scene, but I okay. If, if they if they did that scene, no problem. Um, second of all, um, why does why does Sirius bark at Harry? Yeah, yeah. In the, in the in the book, Harry sees the dog lurking, watching. Then he looks around again, and he's gone. He's like, oh, maybe I just imagined that. But he, the dog full on just barks at Harry. What's he trying to do? <laughs> he's trying to get Harry's attention. Yeah. Like, it just from the context of the movie, Chris, we know he's going to Hogwarts with Pettigrew. So what's the explanation for him hanging around at, at, at watching Harry? I know what the explanation from the book is, but in the movie, yeah, why is he there barking at Harry? It doesn't. It it doesn't give one down. <laughs> mm. What about um, Harry randomly seeing a the, a dog in the clouds as the Dementors approach him? What the fuck's that about? Yeah, that that it, it look it looked great visually. Yeah, it, but look, I was watching, the lightning it, hits, the dog shape is there. It's, it's a cool visual. What the fuck does it mean? The, what has that got to do with it anything? happening? Yeah, because I was like, are the Death Eaters forming a dog? <laughs> I was like, is this Harry's mind? Yeah, no, that I had the exact same reaction of, huh? Um, just to say before your next note, ha- Hagrid gives Harry the book. That's a book of photos. We don't see all the photos, so it is reasonable to assume. Okay, he fine. Took the okay, that, I, t- I take that one back then. I, that, I I assumed they'd cut that scene, but if that scene's still in there, then that's sweet and m- nice and makes sense, and I like it. Thumbs up. Um, I'm fine with Med- Hedwig magically sensing where Harry was going. Why the fuck does Fudge know? And I've checked the book. The book doesn't explain it either. They're both guilty of this. Why the fuck does Fudge know where Harry's gone? Yeah, oh, completely. Just, just, just shows up. <laughs> uh, see, I, I looked it up, and I see if I can find some information. People were just like, "Oh, well, you know, Leaky Cauldron's kind of the gateway to the magical world, sort of through. If you want, if, you, if you're going to go anywhere, you're going to go there. Uh, all right, yeah, fucking like, 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 Fudge is going to do some guesswork. Just show up and hope that Harry then turns up shortly thereafter. Whatever. Also, in the movie version, um, does it does it seem does it, does it seem like Fudge has an office at the Leaky Cauldron? Because that's sort of what it looks like. Yeah, why is that scene not set in his bedroom? I was like, why why does this need to be in an office? This is weird. Yeah, because so I went back to the book to see, and in the book he literally says, have you got a a room for me to talk to Harry in? And it is a separate room to the room Harry then sleeps in. But it's also a room. It's not like set up for... It's got a chair 
you know, like an armchair and there's tea served, but it's not like an office with a big desk and stuff. So I don't know what the fuck they were trying to imply with this. Just Fudge has an office at the Leaky Cauldron, I guess, for when he wants to get away from the Ministry. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, um, also, oh, no, I, li- I do like that explanation, I must admit. <laughs> What's that, sorry? I do like that explanation. Oh, yeah, Fudge, is, Fudge sometimes needs to get away and he's got an office. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's sick of it. He's sick. Look, he, he's, he's Minister for Magic. He's a busy man and he's sick of your shit. Um, <laughs> he's, got an office, he's got an office at the Leaky Cauldron where he gets bothered by Tom instead. <laughs> who is just a weird comic relief character now. Fine, I guess. Whatever. The other one that got me is Fudge says, and tomorrow you'll be on your way back to Hogwarts. Um, what was Harry's plan for getting his school things? Oh, that made me laugh so much. A really so nonsensical and so also unnecessary. Cut to the next scene and we'll assume it's weeks later or days later well, yeah, fine. Mate, cut, cut to the next scene Just and I'm going to that. assume you got them that morning I don't need we've already taken the liberty of getting your school books um, now you're heading to the school tomorrow literally the next scene could just be the next morning him meeting Ron and Hermione or him in his room feeling sad about the night's events and confused and then him we don't need any of that that's like explanation for explanation's sake and you, it doesn't putting a hat on it well, raising it, it makes it, it make less sense than just letting it lie because I could fill the rest in it exists to get you to the Book of Monsters, which I don't think the story or film needs, but that's why it exists, so that the well, next scene can be Harry with the Book of right. Monsters. And let's let's talk briefly about that, because the movie has a lot of humour in it. Oh, actually, this is a, to, to take us away from my, my nitpicks for a minute, the Dan in the book moments. Um, What are we thinking of the humour of this movie? Because I'm not sure it works. It's really weird and surreal and wacky. It's like absurd humour in this movie. Um, like the like the like the the housekeeping lady knocks on the door, the door opens, a big monster thing must roar. Well, we can't see it, but an unseen monster thingy roars at her, and then she shuts the door and goes, "I'll come back later then," and carries on. What 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 what, what is this movie? What is this comedy? I don't understand. Yeah, it's an off kilter sort of tone, isn't it? Mm. Um, it's like kind of wacky. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah, mm. that's weird. And the monster book of monsters fits into that. So I guess that's fine, but like, mm, strange. Um, I do obviously, uh, you know, the Dementor in, in, in introduction is very good. Um, I re- I've written in my notes, hate this portrayal of Dumbledore with all of my heart. <laughs> One bit of comedy feel... that does work, though, I really like. Can I just say you're really you're really taking the you're really playing fast and loose with the definition of the word with the word nitpick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one's not a nitpick. That's just in my notes. <laughs> I just spotted it as I was going through for my nitpicks. Because this time I put little stars next to my nitpicks, so I'd know to keep them for this bit. <laughs> so, But I, I keep yeah, noticing other notes of things we haven't talked about. So maybe next time I'll actually separate them physically, so I don't do this. Um, I, I do enjoy... Uh, we haven't talked about this. Dawn French is the fat lady. Um, she's funny. Oh, yeah, she was great. Yeah, yeah, yeah I like the whole thing good. where she's trying to break the glass with her singing, and then she just smashes it and is all impressed with herself. That's fun. Uh, we've talked about this stuff. We've talked about this stuff. We have, have we talked about Emma Thompson as Trelawney in general? About what? Sorry, uh, Emma Thompson's portrayal of Trelawney. No, she's just the just the portrayal of that uh, the prophecy. She's brilliant. She's fantastic. It's a it's a wonderful, wonderful performance. Do you think they needed the scene that follows her introduction scene with McGonagall? So in in the book, um, Trelawney predicts Harry's death. And then McGonagall is trying to teach the class after. They're like, the, like the next lesson is transfiguration. And they're all weird and down and miserable. And she goes, what's wrong with you? You know, this class normally has a lot more energy than this. What's, what's the deal? And someone says, oh, we just, did trans- uh, we just did a divination miss. And she's like, ah, which one of you has Professor Trelawney predicted will die this year? <laughs> and it's it's just a really great way of immediately establishing... That Trelawney is a big old fraud because <laughs> the movie doesn't really do that. And no, but it, I, the movie doesn't need it either. I don't think that's my question because I, I I think it's important to establish that Trelawney is a fraud. But if because if you don't put that in, then I mean everything she says could be conceived perceived as true in this movie. <laughs> yeah, but she doesn't say that much particularly there's a bit mm. in that scene and there's oh, the grim but she's not doing a lot of in the she's doing less predicting in the movie than the book i think that's fair that's fair um i know i'm hitting on even major in points the, now even in 
Go on. Even in this, it's really played as the tea leaves are saying Harry's going to die, not truly, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, this So this is now just notes mixed in with nitpicks. I've got some proper nitpicks mixed in, but I do want to ask you as well, because you're, you know, you're a fan of love stories. You like a good tease of a love story. Ron and Hermione nearly holding hands when Harry's bowing to Buckbeak and flying on Buckbeak. Good moment. Yeah, I like it. I like it a lot. Mm. It does play into what we've set up in the previous movie, I think. It's good. Yeah. Yeah, continuing on from that, and I think that is a... Uh... A very logical addition for the scripts to make. You know, you know that's coming, uh, or you've got a sense that it's coming. I suppose technically, uh, chuck it in. And you know, that's Rowling as well. Like, there's, you know, if Rowling wasn't planning on getting those two together, I'm sure she would have said, "No, take that out." <laughs> right, hundred um, percent. The Harry scene, the flying scene, is incredible. I just want to talk about though the music in that moment. We haven't really talked about it. This is John Williams's last score for the movies. Um, he's great. He does a really good job with the music in these movies. Obviously, iconic Hedwig's theme it will re- forever be iconic and associated with this franchise. Um, and I think he did a really good job in this one, sort of changing the, the music slightly to, from less more whimsical down to a sort of darker tone to match what Curon was doing. I think it works really well. Um, the movie is dripping with atmosphere at all times, uh, like lingering shots with interesting framing, Dementors circling the grounds and killing plant life, things like that. Really cool. And then mm-hmm. the music enhances all of that. So very good. Um, yeah, Dumbledore's weird speech about dreams. Uh, just, just can't get over that. It was so strange. Uh, we've done the dog in the clouds. I've got a question for you, Chris. Just a minor one about how an animagus transformation works. So Peter is is a rat, yes? They Mm -hmm. shoot some sort of anti-animagi spell at him. I don't know what it is, but they don't say it. It's a non-verbal incantation, so fine, no problem. They hit him with a spell, I don't know, Animalus Nomoricus, I don't care. It's fine, it just just works. He transforms to a fully grown human wearing clothes, yes? Yep. So the clothes were clearly part of his transformation, yes? Because he. Oh, he... I had this. I literally paused the film and said this to Jess. Carry yeah, on. So, so, you know, he, 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 he expands from a rat to a person and he's wearing clothes. So the clothes were somehow encapsulated in this form, this rat form, and then they beca- they, were, they returned back onto him when he, he, he got bigger. And if that's the case, Chris, why, <laughs> when he then transforms into <laughs> scabbers later on, do all the clothes fall off him and get left behind? When he next transforms oh, well, into Pettigrew, yeah. is he going to be naked? And if so, why? <laughs> why wasn't that the case like, the previous just, time? I don't just understand. Just have consistency. And you know what? It's it, it it doesn't matter if it defies logic. It's a family children's film. Just have him just have him transform with the clothes. I know it's a cool visual, the the clothes falling to the floor, but it the illogic of it is just mind-boggling. Just have him as I I presume the books do, he he transforms with the clothes transforming as well. It's mm. magic. Like it doesn't matter that it it's illogical because it, it is illogical. The more logical thing is that you know, if someone is transforming, it's just them and not their clothes. But in a world where it's magic, and actually, if you evaporate, you take your clothes with you, um, or whatever. The, I think it's evaporate, isn't it? Yeah, mm-hmm. just yeah, yeah, completely. Oh no, bizarre. no, no! You mean you mean uh, dis disapparate? Yeah, disapparate. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah. So crazy. Last little point I wanted to ask you about, Chris. Just get your thoughts on before we get to Triv. We both complimented the Harry Lupin dynamic in this movie but may i posit that it is a bit weird that we establish that without establishing that and by that i mean harry's sad that he's can't go to hogsmeade and that he's just on the bridge with lupin one of his teachers who he's had no real close proximity to in in the book he Bumps into Lupin. Lupin asks him why he's not with his friends. And then he says, well, you know, come here, I, I, I'll show you. I want to show you something. And they, they end up having a conversation. It leads, you know, you establish them becoming friends. The movie just kind of cuts to it. And you just kind of, having read the book, I just kind of I filled in the gap. Now, the gap, you know, that, that you could just assume that. That's fine. Um... I did wonder if that works, though, 
um, as, as a film, that they never actually establish why these two characters are friendly with each other beyond the student-teacher relationship. Yeah, I think the the acting's doing so much, and the camera work in the bridge scene is doing so much work with that because it is look, it is nowhere near as clean cut as the book because actually, the, and that's just that's indicative of actually their uh, Remus's history with James. You know, the, the whole Maunder's map explanation not getting the time in the film damages a lot, including you know why Harry thinks it's James and what that means in the book. We have him pining for his parents, the entire film, hearing his mother's screams as he, you know, sees the Dementors and it all works. I think that is a bit indicative of that, but I think what they do do with Remus and Harry whilst not perfect is, is still very good. Yeah, but, you, but from a from a viewer's perspective who hasn't read the book, do you think they'd be a bit jarred why Harry is suddenly having all these deep conversations with the teacher? Because we we never stamp, we never have a scene setting them up as moving from student teacher to friends. No, but I think they'd be distracted by the fact that they've kept the line of "Did you wonder why I didn't let you stand in front of the bogger?" Even though he actually fucking does let him stand in front of the bogger, and the bogger properly turns into a dementor. <laughs> like fucking so. Like I was so distracted by that to take any of that in in that scene because I was like, "Why is that line from the book in there when the film has changed what happens there?" Um, but yeah, no, it's a good point. I think someone could easily think that. Yes. Mm. I like the bogger scene on the whole. I like the fun music. I like the way yeah, it's oh, done. Oh, I think they do it. I think they do it the right way. Again, it's a it, it's a good way to emphasize that visual. It's a good way to set up why Draco's laughing at him. Although I can't remember if that's before or after. But do, you don't need the line. I suppose you were wondering why I didn't let the, bo- the didn't let you stand in front of the bogger. Y- you did. We literally saw you do that. <laughs> yeah, but then again, I Just, guess he then jumps in instead of letting Harry actually dispel the bogger but yeah agreed uh, Maybe. it's a bit weird it's a bit weird because he jumps in between them he like arms out like you know gets involved but <laughs> it's, mm-hmm. it's a weird awkward moment but yeah no, point taken i think all right um trivia Tri- is it triv time trivia let's trivia it up i'm gonna give you some trivia so uh where is my trivia you're at here it is. Okay. Chris Columbus originally signed on to direct all of the Harry Potter movies. However, he realized that by doing so, he would miss out on seeing his children grow up. Like, it would take so long to do all seven. It was basically going to be his life for a decade. <laughs> so um, he decided to pass on directing subsequent movies after the second. Uh, but he did remain on board for this film as a producer. But um, after the shooting of this rap, he did then decide to end his involvement with the Harry Potter franchise totally. Uh, first person they turned to in the wake of Chris Columbus leaving was, for some reason, M. Night Shyamalan, um, who uh, they Incredible. offered the job to, and then he turned it down in favour of doing The Village, and we all got off uh, very, very light, because we know what happens when M. Night Shyamalan adapts. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah, I, uh, that's uh, not uh, even... When uh... he, when M. Night Shyamalan adapts, like kids stories with lots of sort of lore set in their own like magical worlds uh, it's, it's bad yeah that that's not even usually we're like oh, i'd like to rick and morty it or step into the alternative world and see see what would have happened there nah <laughs> good Mm-mm. no need for that don't happy want that to at not all. see it happy to not see it Yep. And I mean, admittedly, I get it, because that was the era. I mean, he was it was before The Village, so he was still hot property at the time. So I understand why they went to him, but we, we now know that his ability to adapt previously written works may be not as strong. Um, other directors reportedly considered for this particular installment were um, Kelly Corey and Kenneth Branagh. Um, Kenneth Branagh obviously then went on to uh, do... Uh, had been, or sorry, had already been uh, in the previous movie. And Kelly Corey, I'm trying to figure out what she's known for. As a director, five director credits according to IMDb. Oh wow, almost nothing. Like not nothing, but like that's very interesting. It's a very small list to nothing have potentially... that would nothing that would make you recognise the name. Yeah, like uh, yeah, yeah. It's uh, well, just not a great number of projects. I mean. She hadn't directed a feature film when this was being done. So that's an odd choice. 
Oh no, she had just released Divine Secrets of the Yaya Sisterhood. Okay, so she just had a movie out. So maybe they saw that and liked her. Weird choice. But anyway, um, obviously Kiran was then approached, but having never read a Harry Potter novel nor seen the first two movies, when he was offered the job, um, he was like, nah. Um, they'd also offered it, I forgot to mention this to uh, Guillermo del Toro, who um, had not been able to do it in favour of doing Hellboy. Um, but he was friends with Curon. Um, and it said, don't be stupid, read the books immediately and do the movie. I can't do it, but you should, <laughs> basically. Um, so in order to um, get involved, he then went and did that. He watched the first two movies, he read all the books, and then decided to, he would do it, um, which I think is cool. In order to equate good himself... Advice. Go on, sir. No, I was just saying, good advice. Yeah, I, th- I think Del Toro was right. Like, you, you, Unless you've got something specific planned and you're already busy you don't turn this project down. Like, if, unless your docket is packed because you're already doing a thing of your own, there's no reason to turn down doing one of these. This is a good opportunity to mm. dip your feet in a big franchise like that. And it's always it's always fun to see, like, these more auteur directors that do these more very sort of specific things step into a big franchise and see just how badly the Hollywood system ruins their vision. <laughs> Yeah, but you and you, but you got to give you know Warner yeah. Brothers, and apparently it was a big push of J.K. Rowling's. Um, so yeah, yeah. J.K. Rowling. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah no. that's. But, I don't know if yeah. that's necessarily in my tree, but yeah, Rowling had seen a few of his films and, and was a fan, so um, I, that can't have hurt. So apparently, um, in order to acquaint himself with the three lead actors uh, slash uh, sorry and actresses, um, Curon had had each of the three main leads write an essay about their characters from a first person point of view. Emma Watson, in true Hermione fashion, went overboard and wrote a 16-page essay. Radcliffe, like Harry, kept it real simple and just did a one-page summary. And Rupert Grint, in a very Ron fashion, never turned his in. Um, I have yet to discover, and I've tried looking this up... I knew knew that already, and it's still one of my favourite pieces of trivia about the Harry Potter franchise. (laughs) It's brilliant. The only thing I don't know, and, I, and, I sh- and the answer is probably out there, and I just couldn't, I, you know, I didn't get, I didn't spend a too huge amount of time trying to figure it out. Um, is is whether Rupert Grint genuinely did a Ron on, you know, by accident, just didn't get round to doing it because he's, you know, very Ron like, or if he also in a Ron like way thought his way of getting round it would be to pretend, well, that's what Ron would have done. <laughs> I don't know where Rupert Grint's intentions led, you know, were there, but um, I think that's very funny. And, and here's the thing: either way, I love it. <laughs> yes, agreed, agreed. Um, so uh, Harry Melling, who plays Dudley Dursley, had lost so much weight uh, that he was almost recast. Um, but because obviously, I, well, actually, at this point, had Phoenix come out the book? Oh, I don't know. I, I have to take too long to look that up. But basically, they decided that he could continue to play Dudley. Uh, and would they make basically make him wear a fat suit to make him look heavier? Uh, that actor is actually extremely sl- slender now, isn't he? He's a he's a he's a slim man. Um, and is, uh, I know I know times were a little different, but that is fucking madness. In a in a in a scene where you have a character expand and and you know presumably wear for some of that prosthetic you know fat suits if there's no better term, like. Just put him. Just put him in a suit. That's madness. The the notion that he could have lost the part because he'd lost weight. Like Hollywood's right. fucked up, man. Carry on. Yeah, no, I, I'd agree with you on that one. That's pretty. That's pretty messed up. Um, it, but you know, the thing is, Dudley Dursley as a character loses weight later in the series. So, I I don't know if they knew that yet or not. I can't remember the dates for like Phoenix coming out and this movie coming out. Like, I, I'd, have to, I'd have to do the math. But you know. Yeah, maybe, and if not, even if it hadn't come out yet, JK could have probably said, I think he's going to lose some weight later, but who knows. While you're looking it up, it sounds like you're anyway, I've got to read out this next bit. Uh, Ian McKellen mm. turned down the role of Dumbledore. They actually offered it to him. But having appeared as Gandalf in Lord of the Rings, he said, I had enough trouble living up to one legend. Two would be too much to hope for. He stated it would have been, um, he also felt it would be inappropriate to take on Richard Harris's role um, as uh, Harris had apparently at one point called mckellen a dreadful actor <laughs> um, i kind of love richard um, harris i, I, yeah, I don't think he amazing. was necessarily right for dumbledore but he was certainly more right than 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 uh, gambon and he sounds like an absolute legend 
I just love the way he was clinging onto this role as well. He refused. He was like, don't recast me. Oh, bless him. Yeah. Bless him. Um, to answer our questions, uh, Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix came out on the 21st of June 2003. Principal photography began for this film on February February 2003. So... They were close, but technically the film didn't come out till two thousand and four. But but chances are the the decision the book, the book have wasn't been... out when they were making those decisions. No, no. gotcha, gotcha. Um, David, the, is it Thewellen Thewellis? I can never pronounce his surname, but David Thewellen was uh, Alonzo Curon's first choice for the role of Lupin. He accepted the role on advice from Ian Hart, the man who is who had been cast as Professor Quirrell, who told him that Lupin was the best part in the book. He's right. Yeah, Lupin's, I'd agree with Lupin's, that. Lupin's the best part. Um, originally, they wanted. Well, Thomas no, Win- it, it, I think Sirius is in the books. Wise, I think the Sirius, Sirius is potentially a better part. But anyway, carry on. Uh, in the book, as in in Azkaban. Yeah, I still think. Yeah, I think Sirius comes out of Azkaban the more interesting part. Don't you? Uh, I I don't, I don't think so. I think Sirius is pretty boring and one note in that book i think Sirius gets more interesting much later on uh because in that book he's just like he's just crazy guy that's escaped from prison and wants to kill scabbers he's that's it that's all he wants from anything yeah fair enough enough. i I don't i don't find that particularly interesting he's a he's but you know when we get the more nuance later about the history of his family the expectations for him to be slytherin and to be you know Voldemort's side of things and the fact that he booked that trend and he befriended James. That's all very interesting and makes Sirius a much more complex and fascinating character and tragic character. Um, and all the stuff with him later where he's trapped in his house because he's a wanted man and his feelings of inadequacy towards that. That's all fascinating stuff. I just In this movie, he's just he wants to kill Pettigrew. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Whereas I think there's a lot more going on with Lupin in this movie being torn between his... And it's not really in the movie, which is a shame because they skip a lot of the, the backstory. But the idea that Lupin was kind of, is, is torn between his between two friends and which one of and, and, and knowing one of them betrayed... Um, knowing one of them betrayed uh, Lily and James. God, my brain died on James's name there. Um... Makes him more interesting, I think. You know, he, the the idea that like he 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 has his suspicions that maybe Pettigrew did it, and that Black might be innocent, and being torn amongst that, and then obviously accused by Snape. Yeah, that, that makes Lupin a good bit. Anywho, uh, Tilda Swinton was originally offered the role of Trelawney, but declined. She later stated in an interview that she passed on the opportunity due to negative personal experiences from attending a London boarding school, and that she dil- disliked any movie that romanticised. Such lonely and isolating places. Um, obviously, Emma Thompson was then later offered the part um, and accepted it mostly to impress her four-year-old daughter. So there you go. Uh, you may have noticed. Okay. You may have noticed, Chris, that Malfoy's gang looked a bit different in this. Uh, we did not yep. have Gregory Goyle. Now, a lot of people will assume this is to do with another piece of trivia that will come up in a later movie, where an actor was, uh, I believe got in trouble, was arrested, went to court over selling drugs or something like that. We're going to come to that. Something but like that, yeah. In this movie, actually, it was just the actor Josh Herdman injured his arm and was unable to film most of the scenes. Um, so they cast, uh, is it Bronson Webb, was cast as an unnamed Slytherin boy referred to as Pike in the script <laughs> who filled Goyle's role in all of those scenes. That's what, uh, By the way, something weird, like there's dogs barking and people yelling outside so if that's being picked up on the mic i apologize i don't know what's mm. going on um can you hear it because that would suggest the mic might be i can't to... no okay, okay hopefully we're fine then um the he could have just been in a sling surely i guess maybe he couldn't uh, yeah who knows but that seems a shame but yeah yeah i, I agree with that if there, if there was a way around it they probably should have gone for it but hey yeah. um a clause in Alfonso Curon's contract forbade him from cursing in front of the kids on the set. That's Fair enough. Fun. Nice. Yeah. yeah nice um, during filming, all the pockets on Tom Felton's robes were, so- were sewn shut uh, to prevent him from sneaking food onto set, something he'd apparently done on all the previous movies. Incredible. <laughs> Good stuff. We've um, spoken to him. He's still doing it. 
sew up the robes. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> aware of his fondness for music, Gary Oldman presented Daniel Radcliffe with a bass guitar as a gift when they left. Uh, when when they wait when they finished? Oh, when they met. There you go. Um, when they met. The course... Sorry. When they met. Yep. See. I don't know. If it was when they parted ways, I'm like, legend. When they met, it's just a bold opening. Here you go, kid. Here's a guitar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, it is. Oh. It is. No, I agree with you, but it is. It's, but, it's, but that's apparently what, that's, that's what the... That's what the trivia says, Chris. And I'm sticking with fair it. Enough. Yeah, <laughs> uh, during the course enough. of the Harry Potter movies, Daniel Radcliffe goes through 160 pairs of glasses. Um, what do we got? Did you say during the course of the movie or movies? Movies, plural. Are you just saying that every week then? Is that a thing? <laughs> I'm so glad you finally noticed. I'm the winner. So, um, I have a well, bet. Because last time, I, I thought you said last time movie and just and just kind of assumed it was the, <laughs> the that movie. So this has been a test to see if you're listening to the trip. Right. So I said to Nadia, I was going to put this, I'm going to find a really generic piece of trivia about these movies and put it in every single one <laughs> until you notice. Well, I noticed it was coming up every time. I just wasn't catching the S. Oh, I see. So you thought it was a different number for every movie, how many glasses he went through. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And only then did I, it wasn't, it wasn't the similarity in the numbers that got me. It was that I really heard the S and I was like, wait, hold on. <laughs> I got you. So what's funny about that is, um, uh, me and Nadia tried to put predictions as to when you'd notice, um, and okay. I said I said three, movie three. Yep. Nadia said movie five. <laughs> she had no faith in you at all. That's charming. <laughs> she th- she <laughs> thought it would take five movies for you to go. Pretty sure you've already said that. <laughs> yeah, no, honestly, it wasn't. I I definitely clocked that you because I reacted last time. I'm like, oh blimey, like. I oh, I'd great. always clocked you were saying it every time. I thought it was, and to be honest with you, I would have just assumed it was a different number again. I just really heard the S on movies. Gotcha. That's amazing. That's great. <laughs> so um, but to be fair to Nadia, to be fair to Nadia, I've been known to drift off in the trivia. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. you know what I mean. If you'd have said to me this happens and it's going to take you five to notice, I'd be like, no, oh, fuck it out. <laughs> but I wouldn't disbelieve it. That's fair. That's fair. So, um, this one I need your help with, Chris, very quickly. Mm. J.K. Rowling said in an interview that she got goosebumps when she saw several moments in this movie as they inadvertently refer to events in the final two books. She stated, people are going to look back on this film and think they were put in deliberately as clues. I've had to think about it, and I can't for the life of me figure out what the fuck she's talking about. Any idea? So, this... Yeah, yes, because the, this obsessed me a little bit as a teenager. Because she said that before the movie came out. Right. So I did a lot of, what is that referring to? And okay. like, I don't I don't think there's a quote of her. I'm not sure, but I don't think there's a quote of her clarifying. But the theory on sort of, um, there was a big one, MuggleNet, is it? The theory on those right. kind of sites that mm-hmm. was big at the time is that she is referring to Snape reach, putting his arms out and putting Harry, Ron, and Hermione behind him and protecting them when Le- when rumors ter- when Lupin turns into the werewolf. And mm-hmm. I just think, as a big fucking werewolf, and he is fundamentally a teacher. <laughs> like, like I don't think that's <laughs> hinting that's hi- hinting at his vow to protect Harry because of his love for his mother. <laughs> like rubbish. I see. I see. So, she, I mean, she says a couple of things. Is there anything else that you can... Uh, not that I can remember. Snape, Several Snape moments protection in the of movie. Harry. Mm. Uh, well, I, I would, uh, if anyone knows, please do comment. Um, because I'm very curious as to what these are. Because, you know, I, I can't for the life of me imagine what she's referring to. And I've read the books, so I don't know. Weird. Um, unless, well, maybe, maybe Ron and, Hermi- Ron and Hermione... Yeah, that could be one. That could be one. That easily could be one. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Um, anyway, we don't have the answer, so uh, answers on a postcard, please. Um, send them in. 
The uh, this is a good piece of trivia, but this is quite a famous piece of trivia. So for, for anyone who knows this one already, I'm sorry. Uh, during filming of the sleeping bag scenes, director Alfonso Cuarón, Sir Michael Gambon, and Alan Rickman were playing a practical joke on Daniel Radcliffe. He had requested to have his sleeping bag placed next to a a girl whom he liked at the time, a uh, fellow you know fellow actor in this movie. Uh, I don't know if an extra or one of the the leads. I can't remember. I, I, I should go back to the shot and look and see who it is, but it doesn't really matter. Um, but apparently, what they'd done is knowing that he'd done this. They put a remote-controlled whoopee cushion in the sleeping bag, and um, according to Kiron, Daniel tried really hard to stay in character while everyone else was laughing as a big fart sounds kept coming out of his bag. So amazing! It's incredible. I, do, I think I do that one as well, and it's uh, yeah. it's spectacular. That's a great piece of trivia. I love that they did that. It seems it's so cruel. This poor kid. <laughs> this poor kid. But anyway. Um, uh, Curon uh, also had the idea to have Ron, Heim, Hermione, and Harry wear more everyday clothes more often than their Hogwarts uniforms, which they do do. There are, I mean, to the whole last act of the movie, they're in their own like Muggle clothes. He thought it would give them a good opportunity to show off their their personalities. He gave the Hogwarts students permission to wear their uniforms in any way they wanted in order to bring out a great sense of realism and individuality to the school hence some students wearing the uniforms neatly others having shirts and ties hanging out we've already talked about that but yeah uh that's cool. a great directing decision yes it is yeah i uh, not as keen on them wearing muggle clothes for so much of the movie but uh, you know no you gonna, me neither but what are you gonna yeah do? um yeah. the script makes no mention of professor professor flitwick but wanting to keep warwick davis involved curon had the idea of having him play the choir director um, Mike Newell, who I think he's like, um, who is, you know, I'm going to look up Mike Newell. I don't know. He's someone who worked on the movie, but I'll read the rest of the trivia and I'll come back to explain who Mike Newell was. Liked the look of this choir director and decided to keep using it. Therefore, the choir director became a new look for Flipwick and that look was used in all subsequent movies. So well, Mike, Mike Newell's the director of Goblet of Fire. So I assume that's what that's referring to. But he... Oh, so we didn't work on this, this movie. On. The, the way that's phrased makes it sound like he was working on this movie. I see. Now, I yeah, okay. With that context, that yeah. makes way more sense. Mike Newell liked the look of the choir director and wanted to keep using it. Therefore, the, fire, fire, yeah. the choir director became Flitwick in the next movie. I see. Yeah, basically, from this point onward, Flitwick looks like that because Mike Newell liked how gotcha. Warwick Davis looked in this movie. Gotcha, gotcha. That makes way more sense. Um, it's a weird change because uh, obviously he's like very old and white haired, and he, he's a sort of mini Dumbledore in the first two movies, and it's it is a big change. It's a very big change. Um, yeah, you know, he's had some work done over the holidays. <laughs> sure. <laughs> right. sure. Um, it is Wizard, weird. It wizards can be vain it, too, I guess. Yeah, and I remember thinking. I remember thinking when we rewatched Philosopher's Stone. I, I remember seeing Flitwick uh, cast charms to protect the castle in the last movie. And I was like, he looks pretty different there, I think. <laughs> but I yeah, forgot to mention it, but it's that's an explanation for it. But also, I'm sorry, I, I prefer to think of it as Mike Newell didn't realise <laughs> when watching Prisoner of Azkaban that it was meant to be a different character, so changed it. Um, but yeah, he, sure well, he didn't. Change, he just yeah. left it because he, he thought that was Flitwick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He was just like, oh, okay, fine. Um, yeah, and Warwick Davis was just, you know, pleased to be in it, so didn't say anything. Uh, that's my uh, explanation in my head. But yeah, no, we've uh, we've got Mike Newell next, and then from then on, it's all uh, David it's all Yates. Yates, baby. All Yatesy, baby. Um, let's see. Oh, this is a great one. So you might remember, Chris, the the set for Ollivander's wand shop got reused in the next movie as Flourish and Blots. Mm -hmm. Well, in this movie, it's been reused as the set for Honey Dukes. (laughs) So (laughs) that set, just every movie, just having a new role. Um, I'm really enjoying this, and I hope this 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 trivia continues. I'm really praying for you know. I hope for the last film we get a trivia on what the hell they did for the the Harry Potter studio tour, given that that one set was used for multiple sets. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, I want, I want, I want to see what's going down with that. But yeah, there we go. Uh, so Dumbledore um, in this movie uh, seemingly stalls the executioner by saying that he needs to sign the execution order, but he has a very long name, 
Um, that's true in the books. We don't get the name in the, in the movie, but the name is Alfred per- Alfred Albus Percival Wolfric Brian Dumbledore. And that is his full name. And that is why that is what that is a reference to. That's quite a good little nod to the books without actually doing the thing directly. Mm-hmm. Although, nice. it just occurred to me, that's not revealed until Order of the Phoenix. So that's just a fucking coincidence. It's just occurred to me. Yeah, in, well, unless Row- Rowling was giving them information, but yeah, that is odd. There you go. Anyway, uh, when Marauder's Map is open for the very first time, a little Easter egg, Newt Scamander can be seen. Uh, just meant to be a little Easter egg. Um, the idea that he was just visiting the school and seeing, saying hello to Dumbledore in his older age. That's fine. Oh, uh, what? The guy from Fantastic Beasts? Yeah, the lead character from Fantastic Beasts. But how how do they define how is it, how is it clearly? What is this another test to make sure I'm listening? <laughs> he's he's on the map. Oh, the name! Right, sorry. Cause I was really thrown then, and maybe it would suggest I wasn't listening because in my head I was picturing some sort of my mind. My mind was picturing a flashback, and then my mind didn't go. There isn't a fucking flashback in the film, Chris. <laughs> My mind just went, how did they cast him? <laughs> like, how did they define that it was Nuke Scamander? Yeah, so you just, you, so, you missed the first bit of the trivia, which is when they're using yeah. the Marauder's map, the name Nuke Scamander yeah. can be seen. So yeah. it wasn't a test, but if it was, absolutely proved that I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is, you know, typical of, of, of the triv section. I get it. Hopefully the listeners are at least listening. <laughs> <laughs> um, I imagine. The, the only Harry Potter movie to not gross over 800 million worldwide. All the other ones did. So this one was probably, well, I assume then in that case, this is the lowest performing. Bit of a surprise, but there you go. That is a surprise. Mm. I wonder if that had Warner Brothers worried about the the choice of making it or to direct it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. That certainly will be reflected in the in the in the decisions that follow. So um, mm. we have a peeves situation here, Chris. They did another peeves. We cast. Um, I see. We they sorry cast Paul Whitehouse as Sir Cadogan. Um I like Paul Whitehouse mm. as an actor, and I think he would have been a very good Sir Cadogan. For those who don't know, because you haven't read the book, Sir Cadogan is a really fun character who, when the uh, fat lady's portrait is ruined. Sir Cadogan sort of is put in charge and he's this overly enthusiastic you know, he changes the password three times a day, he's a big irritant to everyone um, he, he's a great character he does briefly appear in the movie you can see him in a couple of different shots when they're, when the fat lady is being, when her portrait's been slashed, he's very clearly looking on from a portrait in the background um, uh, but he never ends up actually having any dialogue or being part of the movie, which is a real shame. And apparently, Paul Whitehouse did film or record at least voice work for it. So it's a, that's yeah, makes me sad. I would have seen. I would have liked to have seen it, that. It is insane, isn't it? Because Dawn French doesn't have much to do. For those in the US that don't know, Dawn French is a huge actress over here in Britain. Like she's a national treasure. Uh, she's a huge star. Been in loads of things. Just like, do you want to come in two scenes in a portrait? Like, yeah. Sure, I do. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but I think, you know what? That that actually kind of works or makes sense to me because it's just like it's such a huge franchise, such a huge commitment. You know what? Hey, don't like you want to? You want you can be in one of these, but we'll just it's a quick scene. Like you just get you just, you, you come in, do some you do, do some do some being funny, and then off you trot. Like it's 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 the best of both worlds yeah. for her. She doesn't have to commit to a large role in this franchise where she's gonna lose like several years of her life. Um, you know, it's just it's just a come in, do a couple of days work. Have a bit of fun, off you pop. You you know you've been in Harry Potter. I I, I can see that being quite appealing actually, rather than you yeah, know, committing right. to being a more regular character. Funnily enough, yeah. um, the voice of the um, this isn't in my trivia. This is just something I, I I noticed. The voice of the um, shrunken head on the night bus, Lenny, Lenny Henry, Henry, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Who at the time was married to Don French? Yeah, there you go. 
bit, bit of bit of on the spot truth. Right, uh, last couple of bits very quickly. The filmmakers wanted to stray away from the traditional werewolf and instead prepay, pr- pr- portray Lupin's lycanthropy as a, de- disabil- a debilitating disease. Hence, in his werewolf form, he's depicted as being emancipated, mostly hairless, uh, making him appear frightening and pitiful. Disagree, making him appear shit. Yeah, it's not a great effect. What do you think of the Dementors? I think they're all right. Yeah, and I, but I think most of what makes the Dementors work is the is the you know the camera choices, the the, the unknown, the, the, yeah, the, yeah, the atmosphere, the music, the lighting, all that stuff selling the Dementors. You know, the special effect is fine, um, but yeah, they're being sold by superior filmmaking. I feel, mm. but that, maybe that's just me. Um, no, I'd agree. On the subject of. Uh, no, I could. I was trying to make that transition work. It's not going to work, Chris. It's time for cars exist. <laughs> the night bus is an AEC Regent Three RT two two forty that has been adapted to have a third uh, deck. Um, there were two night buses built: one for the exterior shots and one for the interior. The exterior of the bus was created by taking an ordinary double-decker London bus, which is the one I just referenced, the AEC Regent 3, and uh, adding the extra level and painting it purple. The other one was just a uh, you know, bus that they built the set into. Um, so there you go. I believe it's on display, and I've seen it with my own real eyes, the, the, the Harry Potter studio tour thing. Nice. Very mm-hmm. nice. It's cool. Um, and on, on the final bit of trivia, Chris, c- cats exist. Uh, two Parisian red Meow. cats were used. <laughs> two Parisian red cats were used for the role of Crookshanks, uh, named Crackerjack and Pumpkin. Their trainers um, actually were saving the fur the cats shed and rolled it into small balls, and then clipped these balls onto the cats in order to achieve Crookshanks's mangy appearance. Hmm. So, nice. Last thing to do is to rank them now. I think I have a conclusion of where I've landed, and I will, uh, as I've just talked for about a thousand years with the truth, I'm going to very quickly just say, for me, I think this comes between one and two. I think two is still my favourite. I think one is flawed, good but flawed, but the, the highs aren't high enough to completely paper over a lot of its flaws. And I think the same is still true of three, but I think the highs are even higher, so it gets away with it just a little bit more, basically. I think storytelling-wise, there are some problems, particularly around the dialogue, but the filmmaking in question is so good that it it definitely pips it above one for me, but still isn't as good as two, which is really well made as a film. Maybe not as well made. Again, maybe not the same high highs, but um, the 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 storytelling in two was just so much cleaner and put to, well put together comparatively. I put two above Three and then three above one. That is my current ranking. We're doing favourite, right? Uh, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I didn't really put too much thought into that, but mm. I guess that is that is an important distinction, isn't it? Yeah, for but yeah, I mean, it always is for me. I overthink this more than most, but yeah, yeah, favourite. Yeah, one, one, two, three. Best to worst, best to worst for me because I would rewatch this film in a heartbeat more than the first two for one. I think the filmmaking elevates it. I think the storytelling is still a problem and is still full of flaws and holes. It functions, and at one point I didn't think it functioned, and maybe I'm giving it too many points for just functioning because at one point I thought it didn't. But I think the the highs are so high that I I already, you know, it's not been that long since we did the Chamber of Secrets. And if you said to me, name three sequences in that that are amazing, uh, maybe the parcel, t- you know, the, the scene in the in the class where the the Harry club. talks to the snake. Yeah, um, that springs to mind immediately. But I'm pretty sure if you ask me that in four weeks, I'm going Night Bus, Harry on Buckby, you know, fairly quickly. Mm-hmm. So... I'm going to say, so far, one, two, three is my ranking of favourites. Mm. Yeah, so for me, one is at the bottom, like yourself, and then three and two. Yeah, I think that's. I think it makes sense that we got those either the, the you know the, the different way rounds, different ways around. 
because I cause yeah, because, when we were yeah, talk, when because... we were doing Chamber of Secrets, I was obviously very enamored with their approach to Lockhart and humor and stuff uh, in a way that didn't quite land for you. So I think that makes sense as well. Yeah, and I think I think equally, I I you have not disagreed with any. Uh, you have not disagreed with anything I said about the filmmaking, but I think I've gushed about that um, more as well. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah no, no, yeah, I know. It's, 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 it's a and, big part of why this film isn't a shit show, um, uh, you know, to the point where I agreed with you that it would have been better to have Curon stay on, um, even with some of the issues, um, but because the issues are in the script, in my opinion, I don't think I think it would have only improved them to have him around more. Because I, th- I just think he understands filmmaking and expressing character stuff better than the other writers uh, the other sorry the other yeah. filmmakers but um but yeah for me two still pips it because two is more cohesive as a whole package um it's on balance two pips it for me i had such a good time yeah, watching no. kenneth brown do Lockhart. i can't express and I'm, i've got to admit I'm... as well i actually think we haven't talked about this pacing wise this feels like the longest film which is incredible because of these three it's way shorter than the other two yeah, because you spend shorter. half of it going, what the fuck's going on? <laughs> and, and I genuinely, to... uh, for the first time since we've been doing this, I checked my watch. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Like, towards the end of the final act, yeah, 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 yeah. When they're running around and it's we're just repeating the events that we've already seen from the new perspective. If the very first time you watch it, I think that's probably going to be a really magical moment where you see it all coming together. But I guess because I know where it's going and that's all it's really doing, it doesn't do it doesn't add anything. It's just now you're seeing the events from that other side. Um, the cleverness only lasts so long, I guess. So I found myself a little bit sort of uh, having to force myself to focus in the last, you know, not reach for my phone. That that was a bit of a struggle towards the end as well. So we haven't talked about it, but I think the pacing is mostly good in the movie. It's pretty. It moves at mostly a clip. I, I I was happy with that, but yeah, I do think the the structure of the book harmed the film inadvertently because of the way the book is laid out. There's nothing you can do about that. You can't change it. Um, that's one of those things you probably shouldn't ever touch. You know the structure of it, uh, the, the way that ending works. But in terms of my experience watching it that was a bit of a pain it did yeah it harmed it slightly for me yeah but also as we said earlier i don't know how you you know that and this isn't necessarily a structure thing this is just because if anything for me the ending felt too rushed but um at the end of the day you've got there's a there is a you know Stephen Fry reading that chapter where where they explain what is going on is thirty oh, minutes long or God he's you know, around he's, so, he's so good in those audiobooks yeah I've never experienced it before basically I wanted to read it to see you know how whether I was being unfair but I didn't have time to read it so last night when I was sort of uh, we had some friends around, so when I was tidying up and like getting a drink and all that sort of stuff, I was like, "Oh, I could like I could listen to it. I could do it that way." So I put it on, listen to those chapters, and it's made me honestly. It's made me go. I might go back to the beginning, or and and do and mm-hmm. do all of these with and and experience them that way because I've never the, I've never done the audio books before. So yeah, I, I've done them a couple of times over the years in place of my usual sort of every year to reread and um, fry. Just so good, and and you know, his Dumbledore is glorious. When you get to those later books, and he's doing like uh, Dumbledore as like you know, kind of a badass, but also really cool and calm. Like, yeah, but I'm talking Order of the Phoenix. You know, when Dumbledore is like, um, oh, you're under the impression I'm going to how they say, come along quietly. <laughs> you know, the way he delivers that with like a slight bit of glee, like he's really going to enjoy <laughs> what he's about to do. <laughs> you know, um, it's it's so much fun. Uh, Fry really nails his performances. I know the uh, American listeners will be very fond of the versions of Jim Dale, who reads them in the in, the, in America. And I think Jim Dale's a wonderful voice, voice, act, uh, voice actor and, and performer. Um, but uh, I've heard samples of his stuff and he's good. Uh, for me, it, it, he, he's not going to, re- he, he wouldn't replace Stephen Fry. Stephen Fry does such a brilliant job bringing a very large cast of characters to life all himself, giving them all really distinct voices. Um, yeah, it's very clever. He's a, uh, he's, he's, I mean, not that anyone needs to be told this, but he's a very talented man, that Stephen Fry. <laughs> um, who, who knew? Who knew, man? <laughs> yeah, who, who knew? Stephen Fry, talented. Huh. Um, yeah, so um, yeah. that's the ranking. That's where we're at. We've we've diverged already, which I'm glad about because we were in the same place last week. 
Um, and we'll see. I reserve the right to change my mind at any point during this. And suddenly put two below three or put one above yeah, three. Yeah, because I, 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 yeah. You know, <laughs> because my, my, my feelings might change as I see them all. Yeah, because I, you know, I struggle with that because I'm essentially putting filmmaking, I'm giving filmmaking more points than narrative, which which doesn't f- feel right. Um, so, yeah, mm-hmm. I, I too reserve my right to change. Yeah, yeah. As we, as we see more and we, you know, the, the scale will change. The, the more of these we see. So um, I'm, you know, warning people that's going to happen. So it's a fair game. Yeah. Uh, if you have anything you want to add uh, yourself, you've got any thoughts on these books or anything that we've uh, gotten wrong or something you don't agree with, uh, feel free to comment below if you're watching this on YouTube or you can find a YouTube video if you're listening to this on on like a podcast platform or you can email us, mail at nothingbustatic.co.uk if you have any thoughts. You can also get us via Twitter. Um, I'm at Dan Doolan. Chris is at C Billingham with two M's, and we have an uh, the at nothing but static without the G uh, Twitter feed as well, which we sort of dip in and out of at the moment. It's I'm trying to bring it back, but it's uh, also really busy, so I'm struggling. <laughs> but uh, that exists also, um, and is uh, it, you know it's a good way to get in touch with us if you have any thoughts of your very own. You can also, if you'd like to support this show, head over to Patreon right now. Patreon.com slash nothing but static, and for as little as one dollar a month, just just one. Just one dollar. You could have access to next week's episode right now. And big shock and surprise for you all, this Goblet of Fire. I'm sure you're all like, really? Goblet next? Huh. Um, yeah, that's how it, that's how we're doing it. We're doing it in order. <laughs> um, I'm very... I'm excited by Goblet. I really am. Because mm. last time I watched it, I felt so angry at it. So I'm intrigued. <laughs> Interesting. Very interesting. I've not seen Goblet is one I've not seen for a very long time. I think so. I'm curious because a uh, Go- Goblet, like while it's it, it it it's never my like it's not my favorite Harry Potter book. Like I said, it's to me it's often a, a tie or a flip between Azkaban and Phoenix. Goblet's usually pretty high up as a book because I really enjoy all the pressure they put Harry under in that book. Um, that's always just really exciting like to see that play out and like it's such it feels like such mm. making such big bold moves like putting him in the competition but him not knowing how and why the whole school turning on him it makes a lot of really bold story choices having him and ron fall out like it's a great it is a really great book um but i'm mm. very curious as to because that book's one of those books that i also do know that strictly speaking doesn't make sense like the book doesn't it's the only harry potter book with like real obvious plot holes so yeah maybe but no and i look forward to because i can't particularly remember them so i look forward to kind of exploring that uh next mm-hmm. week although to be fair i wouldn't have i didn't really remember the serious thing it was listening to it and i i never i've never felt that way reading it but i think that's because i i had the whole book of harry's exci- you know harry wanting to get out and a wizard family and what that would mean and the dursleys and all that stuff but when you really just take those scenes in isolation and you hear them and you hear stephen fry mm. doing this menacing gruff Sirius, <laughs> when Sirius is then like, oh, by the way, I'm your godfather if you want to move in and harry gets a pit of joy and all that stuff you're like <laughs> this is quite the quite the U-turn. Um, so I didn't remember that going in. So if we naturally uh, discuss those kind of holes and stuff, um, I think that'll be uh, that'll be really interesting. Um, yeah, but yeah, you know, yeah. I don't and think I, Goblet of Fire is the only Harry Potter book that I think genuinely has plot holes, like proper plot holes. Yeah, because to to clarify, neither of us, I don't think, think there is a bad Harry Potter book. I know, you know, some people don't like Half-Blood Prince, but I think the Horrorcrux stuff is fantastic. Some people don't like Order of Phoenix. They say it's too emo. I disagree with that. I I really disagree with that. I'm talking about the books here. Um, So, yeah, I don't think there's a bad book. Yeah, and... and, and Yeah, no, I think that's true. And I think Half-Blood Prince is a really interesting one, because Half-Blood Prince is essentially... It, it's. I think the reason people don't like Half-Blood Prince is because it doesn't really have an ending in the same way that the other ones do, because it's 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 setting up the plot of the next two. Like every other Harry Potter book, there's a certain amount of closure for the story that began within that book. Whereas Half-Blood Prince is the only one that leaves it. Like it's it's, pr- it's a proper empire. Like it's the, it's all gone to yeah, shit. But the, the... Yeah, and without you know extending this podcast, discussing a, a book that isn't even the isn't even the adaptation we've just discussed, um, and I think a lot of this stuff will be relevant for that. 
my defense of that would be one it's it's war we're building up to the conclusion like mm-hmm. you know yeah. it, it all that stuff add weights and two a lot of the big stuff what the fuck is malfoy up to concludes what's the unbreakable bowel about uh bowel about concludes who is the half-blood prince concludes like dumbledore's the quest to find out what's going on and learn enough about tom riddle's backstory to inform what they do next concludes like do you know what i mean i think the i think the the things that don't conclude are overarching series things the Mm. the story of the of the book the story of the week it's all of that stuff concludes in my in my opinion is it maybe because some of the character stuff is left open where usually the characters feel like they've... Because cause I, I, maybe it's that the character arcs are midway through when that book ends. You know, Harry's in a midway point torn because of what's happened with Dumbledore. I, maybe. Is that part of it? I don't know. I, I don't have maybe, to think about but it. Maybe, but even even that, I'm like, he makes a decision. He He's, he's off. He's going to find Horcruxes and he breaks up or heavily indicates that they should he should break up with I think Ginny? You know, he, like break, he, he flat out breaks up with Ginny yeah yeah so I think even that like he mm. he yeah I'm not sure that's uh yeah it's interesting mm. we will interesting. We well we'll come back to it but um, I will say just separate note Chris um I actually prefer the way you say horcrux because you basically say horror oh. crux and I think that's that's actually better than horcrux yeah though that is how it, that's another one where that's just always been that in my head <laughs> No, no, I, I, I mean, you know, Chris. There's, keep at it. I prefer it. There's something I don't think is particularly explained in the film, if memory serves. But we'll get there, people. But we got the Goblet of Fire first. So we've done, we've done where the people can find us, can't we? So uh, in yeah, that so case, uh, yeah, and if it's if you want to support us, we've done that. You can go to Patreon and get episodes a week early. Um, the other thing you can do to support us, of course, is leave a review on iTunes or uh, Spotify or whichever platform you listen to podcasts on. Um, and the other way you can support us, of course, is tell a friend. You got a friend who likes Harry Potter? You probably do. Most people do. Harry Potter fans are lurking everywhere. Not as vocal these days. A lot of uh, a lot of uh, <laughs> Deathly Hallows tattoos being removed is my understanding. <laughs> it's it's so funny, isn't it? How because sometimes you know I'm we're very in that world. You know we we do we do a television you know media podcast. We talk about films and stuff as well. We we are we, both of us are regardless of whether we did that. We frequent you know Reddit and and watch engage mm-hmm. with other podcasts and YouTube content about pop culture. So sometimes you go, you think, is the general public aware of these things? Is it is it that world? I said to someone, not with a, with a, to be fair, with a bit of interest in those things, they do listen to our podcast. But I said to someone, oh, we're doing a Harry Potter cut podcast, and they said as a joke. Oh, does that mean you're now a turf? Does it? And I was like, oh god, wow! Like this, this really has like, <laughs> like is a huge thing for like not just the people that are in the into this stuff. Like, yeah, mm. yeah. I think yeah, I, 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 yeah. I think it's I think it's spreading. I don't think it's there yet. I still think like the the, the, the true casuals really don't have any. Um... Like a lot of like real casuals, like like you know the family market that go see these movies, are still probably not aware of it. You've got to have, I think, mm. yeah, I think the people who've got one foot in the door are probably have got it now, and I'm it's gonna start. It'll it'll continue to spread. But I think there's a, the, the sad fact as well. Of course, there's a lot of people in this country that agree with JK's positions and won't be affected at all by that. So. Well, we'll see. Anyway, yeah, J.K. Rowling, bad. Um, and this, uh, you know, it, it does, as we've already talked about, hamper the franchise. But there you go. Um, cool. So I think that's everything. Feel free to give us a like, tell a friend. Otherwise, that's been... No, no, you wrap this one up. I need to leave it to you. Yeah. Sorry. I think so. I've, I've been Chris Billingham. I've been Dan Dillon. And this review from The Wizarding World has been rewound. Warner Brothers should be paying us for the fucking use of their shitty branding. Upsets you every time, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. I never liked it being referred to as the Wizarding World. Dumb. No, I hate it too, but it just seemed a clean end to the podcast. Yeah, so every week we'll have a little extra bit where I moan about it. That's fine.
<laughs> yeah, where you moan about it and I try and justify it. <laughs> yeah. Come back next week for that. Come back next week for more of that. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>